The Retro Raw number 224, September 8th, 1997. Had a recap of all the Ground Zero matches, including Brian Pillman winning possession of Marlena. The Headbangers winning the tag team titles. What an irony. What ama- the coincidences on these shows, as we shall get to. Actually, mostly this one. Bret Hart beating the Patriot and Undertaker and Shawn Michaels having the big brawl we reviewed. Vince McMahon brought Sergeant Slaughter out for a promo. Sarge said Ground Zero had been three hours of chaos and there would be law and order in the WWF whether WWF officials, looks at Vince, or the fans like it or not. You know, I want to throw in one other thing here before we get any further. just want to mention this. Granny's memoirs, if you'd like a copy, it is pinned on my Twitter, at Brian Alvarez. Mm. She will explain how to get a copy. You send money to her PayPal. And she'll get you a copy of the memoirs. Anyway, point of this is the memoirs are being printed. And so she is asked, I almost said demanded, she is asked that I come over and autograph them. Oh. And I said, I will try to do it tomorrow, but I've got a lot of work Wednesday. It'll either be tomorrow or it will be Thursday. So you know what response I got when I got home from this four-hour drive with the screaming baby? I'm going to read this verbatim. She said, in response to me saying I'll do it either Wednesday or Thursday, and I quote, Don't let me down. Wow. That's a, that is a preemptive guilt trip. It's one of the world. She's guilted you before you screwed up. To hear that. Wow. Continue, so, Vinny. So the story of Sarge's promo is not so much what he said, but how much he sweated. Thank you. He was melting before our eyes like the Wicked Witch. And stumbling and bumbling all over himself. He says Steve Austin his, was out of line, would be suspended until medically cleared. Fans did not like this. They chanted Austin's name. So Sarge announces a tournament for the Intercontinental Championship. The finals are going to be at Bad Blood. And Steve Austin, he ordered to be there to forfeit the title and present it to the winner. Man, that's a good plan, Sarge. <laughs> it's such a phenomenally you bad moron. idea. I did, that did turn this whole thing around for me. Because that's what I love about pro wrestling. This... Authority figure has a monumentally stupid idea, and you know what's going to happen, and it will. Austin comes out, calls Sarge a jackass. Vince says, show some respect. Austin says, I have no respect for anyone in this ring. He called Sarge fat, and to be fair, I believe Sarge at this point was sweating pure gravy. Austin said, it's not Slaughter's job to worry about my neck and the way they are paying me, and he looked at Vince here, while I'm, while I'm hurt, I may as well be on welfare. So Austin drops Sarge with, in all seriousness, one of the great stunners of all time. Man, Sarge sold this like a champ. Sarge took this, at the point when Austin's ass hit the mat and Sarge's head was on Austin's shoulder, Sarge looked like Jimmy Snuka coming off the top rope, <laughs> flying through the air and coming down for the stunner. It was awesome. So Geeks run out to hold Austin back. McMahon shouts at Austin, says, what's wrong with you? Show some decorum. <laughs> Austin starts walking McMahon down. Vince backs away. So Austin joins the announce desk. He throws on a headset and he's ranting and raving. Nobody to tell me what to do. I'll take care of this guy. I'll take care of that guy. And the fans are cheering him on. They're going crazy. And then one guy reaches down and swats off his headset. And Steve Austin, who's legitimately nearly his life ended weeks prior to a neck injury, had this fan fucking around with his neck and he turned around and I guarantee you For a second, in his brain, he thought, I'll kill whoever's behind me. He pulled it together. No one died. But he went back to scolding Jim Ross, stood atop the announce desk with the championship. And finally, it just went to break. But I know Vince always likes to say anything can happen on Monday Night Raw. At this exact moment, I really genuinely believed anything could happen on Monday Night Raw. Nothing is off the table. On both shows, actually. Anything can happen in the Monday Night Wars. As we saw when a fan hit the ring, as we'll get to. Oh, I'll have a lot to say about that. Now listen, I know we've talked many times about how Vince loves to hire backstage interview geeks that all look exactly the same. Generic brown-haired numbskulls that can barely string a sentence together. Why does he love the marble-mouthed commissioners? Unless they're his own offspring. Mike Adam Lee... I mean, you could you could create a laundry list of guys that he has hired to be commissioner that cannot make their way through a sentence. How was Jack Tunney? I don't actually remember. He was the same thing. Was he? Yeah. This was like a favor. They they used this guy as commissioner. Oh, yeah. He just stumbled his way through everything. 
Sarge here. Thank God he took that stunner and reminded me why he was employed. Yeah. They showed Austin giving Ross the stunner at ground zero, and then Slaughter won just a few minutes ago. And he, in a hysterical shot, security was trying and failing to throw Austin out of the building backstage. And when it went to break, they were all still just shouting at each other. Vader versus Bret Hart in a no-holds-barred non-title match. Can we talk about Bret's awesome promo, where he did the exact opposite of Mick Foley's promo, where he gets a cheap pop? This was the most blatant cheap heat when his promo began with, Hey, Cincinnati, you bunch of idiots. <laughs> like Brian Pillman, no subtlety with Bret Hart. No. I don't like you. You're all idiots. So they booked the world champion here in the opener, openly trying to kill his value. When you look back at this whole thing in hindsight, it's amazing they never took the title off him before Montreal, just in their own self-interest. They clearly had no... They did not want him to get over as champion. So Bre Bre well, let me promo. talk about that a little bit. Mm -hmm. Bret Hart was a professional. And had everything with Shawn Michaels not happened, he would have dropped the title anywhere to anyone. Yeah, he said this. So it's not an issue of why didn't they do it earlier. I mean, there was no... They could have asked him the day before his contract was up, and he would have happily dropped it to anybody. Yeah. But unfortunately, a lot of shit happened, and Vince... It's all Vince's fault. Yes, he that's what I'm saying. He it on. No, that's what I'm saying. Yes. I don't. I, I understand Brett would have gone along with dropping the title to anyone at any time. I'm wondering why they never asked him. It would have saved everyone so much trouble. Well, they had a plan. What? Well? Because it, it did not involve making Bret Hart look like a star. Well, that's just what they were doing here. So there's, every once in a while... We'll see. Sometimes we watch these shows, and there's things we have blocked from our memory. Like you, have, you do not remember Henry Godwin ever coming back from his neck injury, for mm -hmm. example. And those things here, where I remember to the syllable what was going on. There's a point in this match where Bret Hart grabs Vader and hits him with a vertical suplex, and Ross goes crazy. What leverage? What technique from the WWF champion? And Lawler cuts him off and says, "Give him some credit." And Ross loses his mind. I did. <laughs> this was not leverage and technique. It was brute strength. That's a, in, in Jerry Lawler's mind, that's more impressive. And Jerry Lawler works for Vince McMahon, so that may be the smart thing to say. So this went on for a while. Bulldog runs out. Vader brings him into the ring. So now he's fighting two on one. Patriot runs out. Now it's two on two. Again, no holds barred match. Owen Hart runs out, so it's three on two. And they go to pile drive Patriot on a chair. When Austin runs down, clears the ring. The hearts run for their life. Austin chases them away, and Austin's music played. And yes, for I believe the first time, maybe in all of wrestling history, but certainly on Raw, a no holds barred match ended in a no contest. You know, at the end of the day, Jerry Lawler was right because there was a spot very early in this match where they were outside, and Vader went to whip Bret Hart into the steps, and Bret Hart reversed the whip. And with pure brute strength, threw the Mastodon into the steps. That was not leverage and or technique. He was just the stronger man at that moment. There was a fan in the crowd, and he had a sign. And at first glance, he had written, Bomb Canada. Oh. On second glance, he had just outlined the word Vader on top. So it said, Vader Bomb Canada. Hmm. But Vader was not very legible. I was concerned for the country of Canada. Well, I'm happy. You to... thought that fan might have access I to just, a I, nuclear weapon? No, I just thought it was funny that you know they hated the Canadians so badly. Yeah, they wanted to bomb them. They've they've never been to Vancouver. It's a beautiful city. Mostly Canada is nice. That's true. All of it. Just the border. Just the fucking Just border. And really, getting back to where the other way is harder. Well, mm, no, no. It was much harder getting in than mm. getting out. Mm. Yeah, especially if he said something stupid. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> they showed the headbangers winning the tag titles in a four-way at ground zero when Austin ran out and stunned Owen, giving them an easy pin. And the headbangers were shown celebrating with fans at the concession stands. So showing this package, and the package ends, and the Godwins are in the ring beating up two geeks. What's going on? 
Well, I think it was supposed to be the headbangers against the geeks, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. the Godwins beat up the geeks, yeah. and they demanded the match with the headbangers. This is not me. Now, why the world tag team champions would be facing two geeks randomly on Raw is a question <laughs> not answered here on this program. So the headbangers come out, and the announcers make it abundantly clear this is a fight. This is not a sanctioned match. Then a referee appears and calls for a bell. You know, not only do I have no memory of Henry (laughs) Godwin wrestling after breaking his neck. Right. I'm certain there was no third Godwin. I know, right? (laughs) I would have quit my job. The third Godwin, by the way, I've, I've noticed that the Godwins have added Confederate flag patches on their... Yeah. overalls mm-hmm. and then the third godwin the dirty white boy yes. or tl hopper as most of you know him came out in a confederate hat i don't think most people know him as tl hopper i don't think most people know him okay. i know they don't know him as uncle cletus no because no. he did not exist in this timeline when i was watching this show i'm uh, certain of it uncle cletus godwin the dirty white boy tony anthony he ran in ended the what would have been a horrible match i described it as this must be what wrestling in hell is like <laughs> Can we talk about Vince's quote? I will read it verbatim. As Vinny said on Thursday, and I quote, Oh, great. Another Godwin. Just with the WWF needed. Yeah. That's what he said. That's his fault. So the finish was the third Godwin ran in and he cost the Headbangers a match. So to recap, the Headbangers came out of nowhere to win the tag titles. And then their first appearance after winning the tag titles lost to the Godwins. Well, you know, they need challengers to keep these belts. Mm-hmm. meaningful should mention by the way that uncle cletus did a promo he's the talker of the group even though henry is a mighty fine promo he said that whatever he tells the godwins it's money in the bank so chris jericho did not <laughs> he Jeez. stole it invent the money in the bank he stole money in the bank from uncle cletus uncle mm-hmm. cletus i need this added to wikipedia was the man who invented money in the bank they showed Pillman kidnapping Marlena the night before. And I realized that due to the steps of the match, when he won, she had to be his personal assistant day and night. But he kidnapped a woman. He threw her into a truck, the truck drove away, and Goldust was sad on the street. Sunny came out. She informed the crowd she had been hanging out by the men's showers. She brought out Dude Love for a promo. And then she left. So out comes Dude. He's being Dude Love dancing down to the ring and I'm watching this thinking this gets worse every week this is a midlife crisis in action <laughs> this is uh, a, a guy who never had to live out his childhood dream and I think it's supposed to be but it still comes off as bad TV but it is uh, a guy who is trying so hard to be cool and failing and you understand why he was not cool as a kid Vincent Man asks what is it about dude people like I don't know Dude calls Pillman a wacky, nutty, far-out cat. Said he needed a friend for moral support and brought out Goldust. Goldust came out with his face half-painted because he's... The announcers didn't point this out, but I figured it out. He's missing his better half. Oh. Oh. Wow. Yeah, very good, Vince. Thank you. That is very, very deep. So it's supposed to be Dude Love versus Brian Pillman in the first round of the Intercontinental Title Tournament. Pillman's voice appeared in the arena via, via phone call. So he would not appear in a WWF building until the company could guarantee his safety. And I didn't really figure this out until later. They were in Cincinnati, his hometown. <laughs> he was at his house. Anyway, he uh, had, a, had, a, had a video to play. It was from the hotel the night before. Brian Pillman's X-Files. Triple X-Files, Triple Vinny. X-Files, yes. So it's Pillman with a camcorder in his hotel room. Said he was a world-class athlete, but he was exhausted, and for good reason. She wasn't just spunky. She was a machine, an animal. And he held up some lingerie. He and he know. said it smelled awfully good. <laughs> and they bleeped out, smelled. Oh. They did bleep out something, and he had the panties on his nose, so I was confused. Apparently you can't say that her panties smell good on national television. I don't know. He had been wearing a towel. He dropped it to reveal underwear and said the only thing they got between him and his Calvins was your wife, Terry. (laughs) Billman's complete lack of subtlety. I love it. (laughs) He starts filming the room, which is all torn up. There's clothes hanging everywhere. Asks Dustin if he knows where his wife was and promised part two would come later. And Goldust could do nothing but stand in the ring, seething. 
I don't want to be lewd, but I'm just going to tell everybody the facts of life here. Shall I get a pencil and paper? Brian Pillman cares more about fucking than the Intercontinental title. Yeah. That's a factual statement. He no-showed a tournament match for the Intercontinental title. I think that could be said for all of us in the room. Because he was very busy. It was Marlena. This was the beginning of the end of this championship. <laughs> when we were a child and we remember Brett and Sean and the Intercontinental Champions and Ricky Steamboat and all of these great champions, this was where it all fell apart. Dude didn't give a shit about the title. Yeah. Goldust got DQ'd for a low fluck, a, a fucking low blow, a low flucking blow. Right. In this fucking tournament, he didn't care one bit about the title. Yeah, you are correct. I hadn't thought about it, but yeah, it's true. This was where it fell off a cliff. Well, speaking of falling off a cliff, this show. Mm -hmm. Not that it was really on a cliff, actually, but Pirate Tita Morgan versus Max Mini. You mean Parita Morgan? They could not say his name right for the life of him. Vince called him. So they say, Max Mini, the world's smallest athlete, what excitement he brought to the pay-per-view. And they show a highlight reel of the pay-per-view, I'm thinking, he's going to be doing flips, he's going to be diving out of the ring, he's going to be going over guys, and and then arm dragging, and all the great lucha spots. The highlight from the pay-per-view is, he runs over to the announce desk, he, put, he jumps on Jerry Lawler's lap, he puts on Lawler's crown. This surprises you, Vinny. Why? I don't know. Why does this surprise you? I don't know. So they're doing this match. It is every Lucha mini-match ever. None of the announcers are sure what to make of it. None of the fans are sure what to make of it. The best the announcers could do was... Uh, Pir Pirita Morgan was uh, fat and huge. They treated this as midgets doing comedy. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And Max won with La Mahastral, which, uh, to be fair, had absolutely zero credibility because mm -hmm. he's a quarter of Morgan's size. Dude, yeah. this was the slowest La Mahastral cradle mm -hmm. in the history of professional wrestling. Yeah. The fattest opponent of all time to take one. What I got out of this match is that Max Mini, what do they call him? The world's smallest athlete? I believe right. so, yeah. He still took less steps to get across the I ring knew you were gonna say than that. Becky Lynch or Dean Ambrose. <laughs> it's a fact. All right. You can go count. You'll never watch Becky Lynch matches again. I may have to. When uh... you see how many steps she takes to do everything. It's mind-blowing. That's unfortunate. Dude, <laughs> you'll never watch him the same way again. I'll be sure and count the next time I see her. It's less with Dean Ambrose. He just moves really slow. She moves her feet remarkably fast, but goes nowhere. Up and down. Like a Flintstone. Oh. Yeah, trying to get the car started that way. Yeah. So they go to the announcers, and the announcers very casually... Matter of fact, we announce that at the next pay-per-view, Shawn Michaels will face Undertaker in a new match called Hell in a Cell. Now, speaking of coincidences, mm -hmm. are you telling me that this just happens to be the week that the last Battle of Atlanta shows up on the network? Just the week that we are watching the announcement of Hell in a Cell? There are no coincidences. There are me. no coincidences. No way. They recap the Shawn Taker feud promised there to be no interference from anyone inside hmm. the cell. Because there's no way in and no way out. Yeah. Taker comes out for a promo. Usual corny dialogue about death and damnation in the eyes of the Reaper. Sean appears in the big screen, says Taker and WWF had backed him into a corner. He had still escaped. He was a survivor. He vowed to survive in the cell too. And if he was going into a coffin, he was taking Taker with him. He did not just escape Vinny. He escaped with his life. It was in danger in this feud. Sure. Sonny interviewed the Hearts. <laughs> Owen said he was not scared of Austin. He'd taken him out once. He'd do it again. Does anyone love saying the word ass more than Owen Hart? <laughs> there isn't anybody, is there? It's been for this whole time on, 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 on Raw, like no one would say the word, then Austin would say it and everyone was shocked. And it's almost like everyone else at the same time figured out if Austin can say it, we can say it too. So they'll say... I whipped his ass, and if he tries to get me again, I'll whip his ass again. He does sound like a fella who wrestled for many, many years, and nobody ever allowed him to say, kick your ass. Yeah. And he always wanted to, and finally, yes. finally he's been given the green light, and he's going to make up for it. It's almost like 
not that any of us ever use profanity on our parents or anything, but there's a point where you will never, ever, ever curse in front of your parents, and then one day you'll just try to get ass out there. Mm. No? That's me. No, no just right. you. I never had that problem. I guess, no, that's true. <laughs> anyway, he promised that Brett and Davey would be there to watch his back as he whipped Goldust's ass and took a step towards regaining his championship. They showed the tournament brackets, and Dude Love and Brian Pillman were still listed as a match. Oh, yeah. Didn't Pillman forfeit? Well, you see, they're giving him a bye due to fucking. <laughs> or they're not giving him a bye. They're giving him a... A second chance? Uh, they're uh, delaying it. Delaying it, yes. You're busy fucking. <laughs> when you're done, you can have the match. That, so, I swear to God, that's the storyline. That line. is the storyline. Someone in UFC needs to try this. It's time for your <laughs> match. I'm busy. Come back in an hour. Owen Hart versus Goldust. Speaking of burying Brett, Goldust jumps Owen. He's beating him up. He's kicking his ass, in fact. And they go on the floor, and Brett goes to make the save, and Goldust turns around and drops him with one punch, and Brett goes down, and he's done. Meanwhile, Davy Boy Smith is right there. He could have been the one to be punched. No, it had to be Bret Hart, the world champion. These men run the ropes much better than Becky Lynch. No shit. Or Dean Ambrose. Both guys are tremendous. And let's see. There's a bunch of low blows, and finally Goldust hit another low blow and got disqualified. What a tournament. What action. So the hearts are attacking Goldust when Austin shows up. He whacks him with a broom. He points the broom at Vince, who leaps to his feet in fear. And I went back and counted at this point. To this point at Monday Night Raw, in four matches, we had one clean finish. And the winner of that match was Max Mini. So Austin left. Pillman calls in again. Congratulates Owen Hart on advancing in the tournament. Shows another video from the hotel room. There's the shower is running. It's all hot and steamy in the bathroom. He promises he promises that Terry is in there. He hopes Dustin gets a good night's sleep because he's going to have a hard time getting to sleep himself. Pillman was the best troll. <laughs> Can you imagine if you were alive today, the fun this man would be having on the internet? Oh. He would have thousands of eggs on Twitter. I just imagine Brian Pillman on Twitter. Oh, what a waste. They recap the match we just saw in the Hearst at a backstage promo. Vince referred to Owen's victory, his movement in the second round, as an unceremonious advancement. <laughs> no shit. He got disqualified for ball hitting for no good reason. Brett demanded the WWF do something about Austin, suspend him for life. Bulldog plugged the European pay-per-view and promised he would teach Shawn Michaels about justice. Oh, man. Wait till we talk about that one. The next announced match was Patriot versus Hunter Hearst Helmsley versus the British Bulldog. But as Bulldog was coming out, Shawn and Hunter zoomed in out of nowhere, put the boots to him, started whacking his knee with a chair. As the announcers were asking, where the hell are Brett and Owen? That's a goddamn good question. Where the hell are Brett and Owen? Well, apparently the story is that when they went over for that UK pay-per-view, Bulldog was headlining against Shawn Michaels. Sure. Right. And he was going to win. And so Bulldog was going to be a babyface over there. Yeah, of course. And so I guess they just figured he's got to be triple teamed by these heels so that he will be cheered because, in the UK. Because you never know. Those UK fans may boo Davey Boy <laughs> Smith. You never know. And as I remember, at the, at the one night only pay-per-view, Davey Boy... Uh, dedicated the match to his... We'll get to that. It's not... It, we're not watching that show. There's plenty of time to tell that story. Trust me. This <laughs> will come up many times. I do remember them working on Bulldog's leg during that show the whole time, so... I just like the idea that we better build some sympathy to make sure the British Bulldog gets cheered... Yes. ...in Britain. Yep. You just never know. Morons. So after the break, Savio Vega has offered to take Bulldog's place. And so the main event of Monday Night Raw this week, yeah. Hunter Hearst Helmsley versus the Patriot versus Savio Vega in a three-way. You know, before this match even began, I thought, okay. <laughs> I realized that Savio Vega was a pretty good worker. Yeah. But you're removing the British Bulldog and you're replacing him with one of the Bariquas. This is not going to get over with the fans. Now, sure as shit, this did not get over with the fans. But worse, this match was horrible. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. This match was atrocious. This match, you know what this match was? This it match was 12 minutes is what it was. It was a different kind of awful, 
Yeah. But it was just as awful as that New Day segment on Raw. Mm, I don't know about that. It was a different kind of awful, but it was just as awful. There were fans leaving. There were fans chanting boring. There were millions of fans turning the channel and watching Monday Nitro. This was horrible. No one had any idea what to do in this match, and so for a good chunk of it, it was actually Patriot and Savio working together to double-team Hunter. And this two-on-one beating of a mid-card heel did nothing to get anyone over. And then a good, at least at least seven or eight minutes into the match... This match went 18 minutes. Okay, you said 12. You must have included the commercials. It went 11.46, according to my watch. There, this went 18 there minutes were, with those commercials. I'm pretty sure there were two commercial breaks. Seriously. Yes. Okay. So, yeah, I buy that. 18 okay. minutes with commercials. So, in that case, let me revise that. A good 10 or 12 minutes into this match, let's do a triple head scissor spot. <laughs> oh, my God. And they'll just lie there. Okay, I'm going to defend yeah. these guys a little bit, okay? When you watch Raw nowadays, they've had 19 years of doing triple thread matches. They've got agents who know this match by heart. They have guys who have done a million triple thread matches. This was like the second triple thread match of all time in WWE. There was one like a few weeks ago that was the first, which they didn't even have a name for it. Right. They called it like a three-person match or something wacky. So these guys had no idea what to do. That's clear. They just had to go out and do a match with three dudes, and they were lost. <laughs> At the very beginning, I'm trying to think about who it was, I think it was Savio and the Patriot. I can't remember, but one guy was beating the shit out of the other guy. Then he just stopped and grabbed the guy and pointed the other guy, and they went and beat the shit out of him. Yes. Yeah. yeah, it was Patriot and Savio attacking yeah. Hunter. Yeah. So eventually, let's see. Uh, I'm glad you said it like that, Vinny. I don't know what happened at the finish. <laughs> I watched it. I had no idea. I did not go back and watch it again because I knew I had three hours of Nitro to get through. Yeah. I just gave up and I hoped you knew what happened at the finish of this train wreck. All right, here's what I wrote. Ref got bumped and missed a few pin attempts. Sean jumped in the apron. Sean Michaels was on commentary. Sean jumped in the apron to distract Savio, then made a show of checking on Patriot. Hunter threw Savio into Patriot, then cradled him to get the win in one of the worst matches of his career. Did that clear anything up? Well, not really. Okay. But I did, you know, we always talk about how when you're on top, it takes a long time to turn things around the other way. And when you're struggling, you can put on good show after good show after good show, and it takes a long time to turn the ratings around. This was not a good show. <laughs> I was wondering where you're going with that. The Austin and Pillman stuff was good, but if you want to know why everybody was watching Nitro and not Raw... Even with Steve Austin gaining steam and Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels, we had hog farmers. We had this horrible main event. We had the headbangers as tag team champions. There was bad, bad stuff on this show. And I would have switched the channel, personally. Yeah, so for the finals, there were five matches in the show. I cannot count that main event finishes clean since no one knows what happened. So the only clean winner on the entire Monday Night Raw was Max Mini. Yeah. Uh, so the break was came out and Vader and Patriot, or I guess are a team now they came out and everyone was Vader and the Patriot. I can only assume someone said, Hey, that guy's got a mask on and that guy's got some kind of headgear on team him up. And, uh, Sean and Hunter were, had chairs and were defending the ring. The, one of the few good things in the show at the very, very end, Sean is taunting Vader. He's kind of doing that little, that, that little crab walk that Vader does back and forth, holding out his hands. But it's Sean, and so he cannot help but watch himself on the Titan Tron while doing this. <laughs> it never gets old for me. You know what's amazing? I know everybody loves the later version of DX with Billy Gunn and the Road Dog and all those guys. I always thought the best DX was the original. Hunter, Sean, and China. Mm -hmm. I know Craig will agree. I know all real wrestling fans will agree. But it's funny because so far, it sucks. <laughs> it's, Give it time. To be fair. I think it gets better in the next couple of weeks. Yeah. But what you got to remember is Sean's out of here in March. Uh -huh. That's it. Uh -huh. That's the entire length of what is now remembered, by me at least, as a legendary stable. It was. It came and went in the blink of an eye. Yeah. They, they were not even named DX for at least maybe another month. No. 
And it's amazing. It's September 6th. And every time that I go to watch Nitro on the Apple TV and I scoot back to 1997, it starts with the final Nitro of 97 and the graphic is Bret Hart. Yes. <laughs> this fucking guy is almost out of here. Mm hmm. My, how time flies. This, the, the, hey, I mentioned this in January when we started this. This was a crazy year. It was a very crazy year. It was an insane year. year. To end the show, they actually uh, showed the camera on the ring entrance, or the, the ramp entrance, and the Hart Foundation started strolling down to the ring. The Hart Foundation consisting of Owen, Brett, and the Bulldog, who was walking just fine. Well, there you go. Retro Raw number 225, September 15th, 1997. Open with Ken Shamrock versus Farouk in the Intercontinental Championship Tournament. Okay, what's going on with the Intercontinental Championship? Uh, Austin had it. He is stripped of it. I see. But I believe he still has possession of it. Sure, that's right. He's got to show up and hand it over. Yes. Day. Okay, I remember yes. now. I had totally forgotten this storyline. This compelling storyline <laughs> of the Intercontinental title. So, a few minutes in, Sham or Farouk hit a spine buster that appeared to legit fuck Shamrock up. That's right, because Pillman was busy fucking. Yes. But he's getting another match. They just gave him a delay. Okay. Said, I remember now. Enjoy your romp, Brian. This we'll is, see you in a week. This is where the title was killed. Basically, yeah. We got that. Okay, yeah. I remember now. My memory is refreshed. So, Shamrock takes this spine buster, and he is immediately left staring at the ceiling, glassy-eyed, uh, barely able to move. He rolls out of the ring. He's spitting up blood. Farouk was doing what he could to kill time, talking to fans and mean mugging, and eventually he got Shamrock in the ring, hit a snap mare, he stood back and he waited for Shamrock to get to his feet, and he walked up and ate a belly to belly and got pinned. You know, watching this show, I just feel like I'm so out of the loop. How so? So, why is Shamrock bleeding internally? I think this was a legit injury. In a nothing match with Farouk? Maybe he... I think he took the spine buster and got messed up. I don't recall this really happening. It's very possible that he bit his face. This is he... not Ahmed Johnson. I understand. Well, that's true. But maybe he bit his lip or something when he took a bump. If this was... It's happened to me. You are also not Ken Shamrock. Duh. Yeah. <laughs> if this was a work, then Shamrock's a better worker than I realized. Well, this looked like he was messed up bad. He was a he was a very good worker, but man, was he just a fella during this match. It's because he was out cold. No, my point is, dude, the heat was when Ken Shamrock, Ultimate Fighter, was going for a leap frog, and he got caught and slammed. <laughs> Why is this guy doing leap frogs? Well, I don't know. This is ridiculous. That I don't know. So he got beaten. No, he got a belly to belly. Yes. Farouk got beaten and then gave him a dominator afterwards. Yes, as gently as possible. Yes, very light. Yep. Nation hit the ring, beat him up. Legion of Doom ran down. Fans were going bananas for the Legion of Fans Doom. Fans were into the show. They actually got a road warrior pop. Yeah, they did. I wanted to use that term, going bananas. Just wanted to. <laughs> it's the way you nodded after you said it. I feel like Bret Hart when he finally got to call the dude a hoser. Yeah. <laughs> I finally got to say the fans were going bananas. So Shamrock was able to get to his feet and celebrate with the Road Warriors afterwards. Steve Austin did a backstage promo. He was very calm, almost relaxed. He assured us that Owen Hart had payback coming. El Pantera versus Takamichi Noku. Where the fuck did this El Pantera come from? I don't know, but this is awesome. <laughs> Mexico, I'm guessing. Dude, this Pantera fella was way better than Takamichi Noku. And I like Takamichi Noku. Yeah, but his gear. But El Pantero, he's a fucking panther, dude. That's the least of our problems. Is, panther he, in pajamas. He's not doing a That's heavy fine. metal band gimmick. El Pantera came out, and he was so great. Everything that he did was great. And it was the El Pantera show. Even mm. Jerry the King Lawler. Mid-South, or not Mid-South. Uh, Memphis. South. Memphis, That's right. Even he loved El Pantera. He was trying to just talk about Brian Christopher, but he was so blown away by this man in a cat outfit that he couldn't help himself. Mid-South Coliseum, that's what I was thinking. You know the other reason this was great, besides just Pantera was great? There is a million matches like this these days, all over the world. Two small men get in there, and one guy does three moves, and the other guy does three moves, and the other guy does three moves, and the other guy does three moves. And they do it for ten minutes, and then it's just over. This was athletically... I mean, there's probably a, a bunch of matches athletically better than this Pantera Taka match going on right here, but this is so simple. Well, I can I'm not follow sure. It. Taka won for a while. Pantera won on a flurry. He had a bunch of moves. Taka cut him off. 
Hit his finish and won. Simple. I could keep track of what was going on. You know, we've been talking about this WWE Cruiserweight division, and the fact that WWE wants a division to rival Nitro's Cruiserweight division. Okay. And they never have. No. It's a bunch of dingbats, a bunch of small, normal dudes doing normal matches, with the exception of Brian Christopher, who has charisma, and Taka Michinoku, who's very good. This was the first match, I think, not on pay-per-view, in WWE. This would have held its own with any Cruiserweight match on Nitro. That's how good it was. This was great. And yet the fans did not care about it. I don't give a shit about them. Fair enough. It's all about my entertainment. I thought this match was great. And if they didn't like it, WWE got their revenge in the next match. <laughs> we had a Truth Commission promo. And he said they were ready for war. We got a very much non-cruiserweight match. Recon and Sniper versus the Legion of Doom. Fucking fans should have cheered when they had a chance. They brought out <laughs> Recon and Bull Buchanan. Like you say it like yeah. it's Decon. I wrote Spray. Decon Dude, kills. that'd have been a cool name. It should have been Recon and Decon. No, no, no. Decon kills rats. Oh, rat, rat poison. Who My gives bad. a shit? They can, they can both. You know about wrestlers and rats. Recon and what's the other geek's name? What's Bull Sniper. Buchanan? Sniper. That's right. No, Recon. Which one's Recon? Does it matter? Bull, Which one's Bull Buchanan? There's, there's one named Recon, one of them... There's one named Recon, one named Sniper, one of them is Bull Buchanan. The one who's the not Rambo. Bull Buchanan is pretty good. That's why I want to know which is which. I see. Yeah, they, they were fitting fine. They both had their moments with bumping and selling that was not the best. But they had a pretty good tag match. Places going crazy. The worst worker involved was actually Interrogator, who would eventually become known as Kurgan. The, yeah, uh, but even he... So much better than Braun Strowman. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> he is. <laughs> I'm not arguing. You don't get to see him because you watch the Hulu version. If you watch this fucker every week, you'd be begging for Kurgan. So Kurgan pulls Animal out of the ring for the heat. And the uh, announcers are saying, he made it look so easy and so casual. That's because he's because he's put four feet taller than everybody else. That's cause also because he half-assed this. He just put his hand on Animal's pants and kind of pulled him out. And True. Blank expression the entire time. So doing this match, it builds up to the hot tag and the the Road Warriors at the Doomsday device and the place is going crazy. And then Interrogator hits the ring for the DQ. My goodness, what a terrible wrestler he was. You know, he was pretty bad. Although, to be fair, Hawk's comeback. I mean, if you've seen a lot of Road Warriors, they didn't have to do a lot of comebacks because they just destroyed guys. Hawk did this comeback like he'd been in the business a year. And quite frankly, it probably had been one full year of him selling in his whole career. Yes. This was ugly. Ugly, and, ugly, ugly. And this comeback has nothing on the comeback in the main event. Don't even. Don't jump ahead. It'll be hours. <laughs> Shamrock runs up to make the save, none the worse for wear. Huge brawl breaks out, and out comes the Nation of Domination. And, you know... There's a lot of divisiveness, div divisiveness in the world these days. Divisiveness. We're a divided planet. The Nation of Domination, a group of black separatists, and they're in there with a bunch of white dudes from South Africa. And I thought, this is going to be trouble. But no, they got along fine. They bonded over a common hatred over post-apocalyptic warriors and MMA fighters. And they were together to beat these three men up. Well, what I got out of this was now I know why Survivor Series 1997 was gang rules. There was 87 factions running around. Just a bunch of gangs running around. Shouldn't Gorilla Monsoon or Sergeant Slaughter have done something about all this gang warfare in this company? It's out of control. Sonny came out to do ring announcing. I gotta talk about Sonny. I know you think you know what I'm gonna say. She's hot. She was here. Huge boobs. But I'm not gonna talk about her flattering bosom. Or heaving titties. <clears throat> Seriously. She's a porn star. Give me a break. Here's what I want to say about it. This Sunny story is very tragic. Okay? Not only was she very good looking. With giant mammaries. Mm. But seriously. She was very talented. Did you notice that she not only was a great ring announcer... She right. was a great backstage interviewer. Mm -hmm. She was very charismatic. Oh, yeah, totally. She knew 
that it was not fucking Parita Morgan. She knew it was Piratita Morgan. She knew how to pronounce everybody's name. Right. She knew everything about all of these different styles. She knew a lot about professional wrestling. She actually was a student of the game. Her and Candido met through the fucking Wrestling Observer Newsletter in the early 90s. She understood this business. She was very good looking, charismatic, and could do her job well. And boy, this could just fall off a cliff. What's so funny? Did the Observer have like a misconnections section? No, they had a man, they had a reader's page. I see. I don't think it was like personals, but you know, oh. she was looking for something and he had it or whatever. I bet, yeah. I bet he did. Yeah. But the point of this is, it's just, you look at some of these, it's not just the women in WWE today, but like a lot of the, I mean, man. Remember Cornette in Ohio Valley? There was a quiz. Yes. There was like a quiz. Wrestling history quiz. Wrestling history quiz. Can you imagine quizzing like 50% of the WWE locker room today? How sad it would be? Sonny was so far ahead of the game and she was talented and good. She, had the, she was the total package. And boy, off the rails. Well, she ended up landing on her back. Sad. Craig, really. What? We're trying not to be lewd and shallow here on this program she got it the, in the depth end. of my analysis of sunny go so, ahead so there was this minis match going on el torito and piratita morgan versus max mini and mr lucky <laughs> <laughs> i tried not to laugh i'm not making this mr. up fucking lucky mr yeah. not even senor lucky mr lucky this was mascarita sagrada but they needed a new name Mr. Lucky. The hours they must have spent. Mr. Lucky. So, this was fun lucha for a while. And then it just kept going and going <laughs> and going. In fact, I've seen all these armed drags and ranas now. You can build to a finish. There was a plethora of armed drags. There were many armed drags. Did you see Mr. Lucky trying to look up Sonny's skirt? Uh, both of them. Max Hence and the Lucky. name. Yeah. Ah. I guess that's why. You know, I got to mention something. I know that nowadays it's supposedly politically incorrect to use the term midget. Right. But it's very important that I talk about the term midget here very quickly. So Mr. Lucky at the beginning of this match was like, I couldn't even believe how bad he was. I actually thought that they just found a random midget and put him under a mask and threw him in the ring. But it turned out that he was actually excellent. And all of a sudden, he was out of this world. I don't know what happened at the beginning. Distracted by Sonny. Could have been. But the reason that the term midget should be used is because there's a reason. There, there are midgets and there are dwarves. They're two completely different things. Right. Dwarf has got the normal-sized torso and the short arms and legs. And a midget looks just like a child. A very, very small person with normal proportions. And these two men here were midgets. I want to throw that out there before people get mad. Had a hell of a match. So finally, Max Mini goes up top, and he is supposed to hit, I believe, a splash on Torito. And he gets at the top rope, which of course is a struggle. He's short. And he gets up there, and he looks out in the ring, and way, way out yonder in the distance is Torito. And you can just see him go, holy fuck, what do I do here? And he mustered his strength, and he launched his tiny little body as far as it would go, and he came down with a headbutt to Torito's ribs, and he was pissed, and he headbutted his ribs repeatedly, and then he pinned him. <laughs> <laughs> Cameron absolutely loved this match. It was great. And then I I wanted to show him the match from When Worlds Collide, the AAA show. Why is that on the network? I don't know. When Worlds Collide? Yeah. I don't know. Maybe it will be someday. It was a co-promotion with somebody, so maybe WCW the, the didn't know me. AAA have it? Yeah, AAA it. probably has it. Yeah. So it went too long for the fans, though. It went too long for me. Oh, really? Seven minutes. Too yeah. Do Love versus Brian Pillman in the Intercontinental Title Tournament. Pillman shows up with Marlena the first time we've seen her since he's been kidnapped. She basically had a goth get up on. It was all in black. She had a skank get up on. She was dressed as a street walker. Okay. Well, and he drags her ass down to the ring, which, yeah. by the way, they're teasing she has no panties on. Right. And JR goes to interview her, and she's got makeup running, and she's crying, and she says, I just miss my baby, and I just miss my husband. And then Pillman yanks her away from JR, and I thought, this is extremely uncomfortable. I did not like this at all. Man. We are, we are to believe that Brian Pillman has uh, seized her as a sex slave. 
Yeah. That is the storyline. That is the storyline. Wow. It was written into (laughs) a contract, Craig. That is improper. Oh, it's okay. (laughs) I agree. Write up a contract? Well, of all... Dude, first off, (laughs) I'm just playing devil's advocate because this was bullshit. But in storyline, she asked for the match. That's true. So I'm sure she drew up the contract. Ah, she secretly wanted Pillman. Well, that's where it was going. That is where it was going. You're right. Yeah. So doing this match, and dude love wrestled like the fattest, clumsiest 1980s baby face you ever saw. Headlocks well, and rope that spots. Was and his that was his what it was. His dude love. He pulled it off. He's making this tubby Ricky Morton come back. And Marlena can't help herself from laughing. She's supposed to be miserable. And he goes to hit shin music. When Goldust comes through the crowd and attacks Pillman for the <laughs> Well, DQ. Marlena was smiling because Pillman was being beaten. That was a storyline. Right. She wasn't laughing at the fat guy stumbling all over. I was. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, Goldust comes out to attack Pillman for the DQ. I believe at this point, I didn't have it written down, but I'm pretty sure there have been four matches in this tournament. One of them was delayed for a week due to sex. Two of them have ended due to a third party ringing and attacking for the DQ. What a tournament! Vinny... <laughs> You're not watching SmackDown. No. Okay. But this fucking company is incapable of doing a tournament. Apparently. A series of matches. Do Brian. you remember when Mabel won the King of the Ring? For example, they just cannot do tournaments, and this was a prime example. Austin came out for a promo. This was a thing of beauty. It was so great because when Jerry Lawler is there, uh-huh. and he's so giddy. Yeah. That Steve Austin gave Jim Ross a stunner. He shows a video package. Steve, let's look at all these announcers you have stunned. Look, you stunned Jim Ross. You stunned Sergeant Slaughter. You even stunned Vincent Mann. As an announcer, Steve Austin, I thought that was great. There is so much overthinking yes. in wrestling today. Yes. When in reality, it's so goddamn easy to be entertaining. And that's exactly what this was. You knew what was coming. So Austin goes to talk. He's in full badass mode. He says, Jim Ross, you were in the wrong place at the wrong time. If you sit your ass down in that announce desk, I won't stun you again. Sergeant Slaughter was arrogant, and if he thought he was going to get away with telling me what to do, then he got what was coming to him. And it's a good thing Vince isn't here or I'd drop him on his head again. He's going off on Owen Hart and the Hart Foundation when they come out on stage to talk. And Brett says, in Canada, Steve Austin, we've got a name for people like you. Hosers. (laughs) Then he pauses. (laughs) It's pride. Yeah, and he says, I've been waiting so long to say that. (laughs) Not since Bob and Doug McKenzie (laughs) have I heard hosers. Yes. He was very happy about that. I like the idea that he's done hundreds of interviews, Mm -hmm. and he's just been biding his time. There's the right time and place for everything. You don't want to blow it early. It's one of these days. Build up to hosers. There's going to be a real hoser, (laughs) and it's going to be the perfect opportunity to tell him. It's like Owen with the ass. Owen loves to say the word ass still. Right. But Owen will say it at any opportunity, Brett bided his time yes. <laughs> over a multi-year career yes. for the exact right moment to call somebody a hoser. So they sent a tall, skinny man down to the ring. This man presented Austin with some paperwork. Owen explained that this is a restraining order. And if Austin gets within 100 feet of Owen, he will go behind bars. So the lawyer leaves, the hearts leave. Austin is taken aback. And he is trying to read this legal paper he's just been served. So he turns his back to Lawler and starts walking away from him. And Lawler keeps approaching, trying to read the contract by peering his head over Steve Austin's shoulder. It was so obvious and so great when it, when it finally happened. Austin would walk away. Lawler would poke his head over Austin's shoulder and say, What is that, Steve? Is that legal? That looks like a legal document. Austin, you can't stand up for this. You've got to give Owen the stunner. And as soon as he says it, Steve just like pops up, grabs his head and stuns him. Lays him out. A thing of beauty this was. And then he kicked the crown far, far, far up the ramp. Yes. Austin was still selling, by the way, the restraining order. He was taking it back and not sure what to do. That's right. Urban Dictionary. <laughs> Hoser. Uh-huh. Okay, this is the top definition, by the way. Did you get the Canada version or the... Uh... A hoser is a Canadian hockey derogatory term that is similar to the American idiot or loser. It is derived from the pre-Zamboni days where the losing team would have to hose down the ice I see. after the game. The example is, snack on that for lunch, you freaking hoser. I never knew that. I hope Chris Jericho brings that term back on Raw in the next couple of weeks. 
So then we have the first of many strange segments. The first? <laughs> well, we just recapped five of them. The first of many of this specific type of strange segment. The screen goes black. Thank you for bringing this up. Yeah, what the heck was this? There were a few random voices mumbling and chuckling, and then about 15 or 20 seconds later, it disappeared. I do not want to be a conspiracy theorist. Okay. And I do not actually think that this is what happened. Oh, here we go. There's a pretty famous thread on our board. Uh-huh. Years and years ago, this guy kept sending a question to the mailbag, and I kept ignoring it over and over and over and over again. And he was getting so furious on the board. His, his, his fury was growing with each day. And I kept not reading his question. I may be misremembering part of this, but the important thing is, one day, I finally began to ask his question. And midway through, I remembered something else. I remembered something that I was supposed to ask Dave. Brian just did the air quotes. I moved away from the question, and I did not come back to it. And this guy got so angry that I believe he quit in fury. Now, this incident occurred at 101 something. <laughs> I don't even remember what it was. But the 101 whatever was used on the board for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. And when this weird shit happened, I was going to ask you guys about it. Uh -huh. And so I hit the thing to find out at what time it occurred, and it was 10142. It's a conspiracy theory. Bring this up on After Dark. My God. What else could this be? Why was there a man randomly coughing in the dark? Where did he, the, the, the board user, where did he get the 101 term? That's where it was on the show when I started to ask his question. On the Observer Show. Yes. I see. Hmm. It was, I, a, it was the most famous timestamp, I think, in the history of the board. I'm sure that's true since you don't do them. I just, figured, right. I just figured that it was the editors talking amongst themselves and somehow it made it onto the... But do you know how you edit? Well, obviously not. Okay, well, if I'm going to edit this show, I'm just going to go in and I'm going to cut something out, like a commercial. Sure. Why would my audio be added to the show? That I couldn't tell you. It was so weird. I'm I actually don't think it was a rib on us for the timestamp, but that's the first thing I thought. It was just weird. Just well, it happened baffling. more than once. Yeah, what the hell's going on? I thought, I think, I'm think i guessing it this was, is how it aired. It was every commercial break there for two or three. Yeah, just black screen for 15 to 20 seconds, sometimes silence, sometimes soft voices. So Lawler was taken out. Jim Cornette has joined the announce desk. And Lawler is backstage. They have him in a neck brace. He is standing up, but still getting strapped to a backboard. Patriot versus Owen Hart. He announced that Owen and Pillman will now face each other in the uh, tournament at Madison Square Garden, which I... And to be fair, it was a stupid question. Which I later realized Madison Square Garden is next week's Raw. <laughs> so Jim Ross plugs a flag match in Survivor Series. It's Brett and Davey Boy against uh, uh, Vader and Patriot in a flag match. And he announces this, and he goes on. And Cornette is smart. And Jim Cornette realizes, you know what? There may be fans watching who don't know what a flag match is. So he goes into the character and he says, well, JR, what, what is a flag match? And Ross says, I know very well what a flag match is. What, what, you told me what a flag match is. And Cornette says, I know, but I'll tell you. And he breaks it down. It's about patriotism and honor. There's a flag in each corner and the team's going to fight so you can wave their flag. He explained it to the people at home in case they didn't know. Later during this match, they plug a uh, Patriot feature in the magazine, in WWF magazine, and Cornette is sure to point out how absurd it is that we have already seen the Patriots face in this magazine. <laughs> I love Jim Cornette. Dude, we know his name. We know his we name. We may as well Wilkes. see his goddamn yeah. face. Let's see. Austin comes out with security on the top of the stage. That's right before the commercial break. They go to commercial. When they come back, Austin is gone, but the cops are still there. He has distracted them. <laughs> he has lured them to the top of the stage where he's free to patrol elsewhere. Remember when T.J. Perkins was suicide and he wore the mask in the ring but not backstage? Yes. Yeah, that was dumb. That was pretty stupid. Yeah. Didn't Shino uh, one of Al Snow's? Was it Shinobi? Could have been. Al Snow had a gimmick that did the same thing. Walk, carry a mask down to the ring and then put it on. So Austin Shit, Nobi. Austin <laughs> comes through the ring. Comes to the, through the crowd to the ring. He jumps on the apron. Owen is scared. Austin tears up the restraining order and throws it in Owen's face, and Patriot is a schoolboy for the win. Owen immediately demands the cops come take Austin to jail. Austin slowly flees through the crowd. Could we have a lamer security crew? <laughs> as far as I know, they never got him. 
They just meandered after him, and he just left. They did show after the break the cops were slowly wandering down a hall and half-assed searching for Austin. That was the last we ever saw them. Watching this match, I realized that Del Wilkes was pretty darn good. He was a great babyface. Yeah, he really was. Part of being a great babyface is the willingness and ability to make a complete ass of your, out of yourself at the key point. Sure. He had no problem with that. Not to mention, his punches were just magnificent and totally light. Yeah. Wait, part of the key to a good baby face is to make an ass of yourself? And a complete fool out of yourself. And not the yeah. heel? A, uh, when you show baby face fire, you can't be a wallflower. I you, see. Yes. So, so, I see. Yeah. I thought you meant embarrass yourself. No. Well, well kind of. Could... I bit. mean, it was embarrassing you, to me when I had to do it. You can't be shy. No. You have to be willing to make a spectacle of yourself. He was he was very spectacular. Yes. It was fireworks in human form. Speaking of spectacular, who wants to talk about Shawn Michaels shorts? Dude. <laughs> yeah. Well, so Shawn comes out. They were tight. In his biker shorts, and... I believe okay. for the next 20 years, these were simply referred to as those shorts. Hold on. Uh -huh. So you got to remember that Vinny and Craig and I are old. And so we watched this. Older. No, we're old. We're old, dude. Older. We're old and we watched this when it aired. And back then, in 1997, there were no big screen HD televisions. <laughs> there were small... Sure. There were small, standard definition televisions. If you mm -hmm. had a 27-inch television, I mean, you were rolling. Mm -hmm. And I could tell you something that at that time, I was fucking not rolling. I had a small, shitty television. And so, at the time, I sort of could tell that mm -hmm. he'd stuffed his tights, but like... Either that or he's got a huge crank. You couldn't really... I mean, people people brought it up that he would stuffed it, and then it was kind of like, yeah, you know, I guess he sort of did. Yeah. It didn't jump out at you. <laughs> Fucking leaped out at me here, Almost. watching this on a big-ass television. Good thing it's not in 3D. With the amplify mode, or whatever it's fucking called. Not only did he stuff it, I'm pretty goddamn sure he put a dildo in his shorts and pointed it due north. What in the fuck was this? Straight and let me up. tell you something else. Let me tell you something else. How's just your side? So what? as I was watching this, there was a moment where I thought, dude, they edited something off this show right here. What the fuck did oh, he I say? Oh, I know exactly what they did. They edited it off the WWE Network. Well, guess what? They didn't edit anything off the WWE Network. They edited this like crazy because it was a taped show in 1997. Right. Live in the building... He was swearing up a storm. He was trying to hump Jim Ross. He was out of control. Was it, was it this time or the next time when Ross was interviewing, he was like jumping up in the air and crotch chopping. That's a different time. That's, That's later. a different time. That's okay. a different time. Because that made TV. That did make TV. The conclusion at the time was this man was trying desperately to get himself fired. I see. The sunglasses... Kind of gave it away that maybe some extracurricular activity was going on. Maybe. All I know is he cut a hell of a promo when all was said and done. That's true. Yeah. If, what if, the, if what he, they got out of it. If it's he true. cuts this promo under the influence, how great would he be? Well, we know how great he was. Yeah. So he cuts this promo. He, uh, Jim Ross asks, why did you attack the British Bulldog last week? Sean cut this entire promo staring directly at himself on the Titantron. Not even shy about it. Says, I have done a lot in the World Wrestling Federation, but I have never... The one thing I've never done, I've never won the European Championship, and that will make me the first man to hold all four titles in the WWF. I talked to him about The Undertaker, and he says, This whole mess started when the powers to be, they made him a ref at SummerSlam. He's still saying it's their idea, not his. He went out, and he was the best ref he could be, and a hell of a ref. And things went haywire, and everyone blamed him. So then he goes out of the pay-per-view, and he has a match with The Undertaker, and he has the best match on the show. And his reward for all this is now they're going to stick him in a cell with death itself. He says, he says, that's fine. You can do that if you want to. But if I'm going down, I'm going out in a blaze of glory and I'm taking all of you out with me. Taker appears in the big screen. He gives every cage match cliche you've ever heard. Two men enter, one man leaves. No interference. No way out. Nowhere to hide. Er. He finishes... Sean says, I have made you bleed before. I will make you bleed again. 
Then he posed in his shorts for a while. It's funny, when Sean was out there, they would cut to random girls in the crowd. The first one, especially, she was grinning. Then Sean jumped in the ring. Her eyes grew wide. And then she looked away. Blushing. <laughs> Headbangers versus Davy Boy Smith and... In for sure the worst match of his entire career, Bret the Hitman Hart. Dude. All I got to say about this, well, actually, there's plenty I can say, but I'll start with this. <laughs> Rarely have I seen Bret Hart just want nothing to do with a match like he wanted nothing to do with this match. Mm -hmm. There are stories that Bret would deny that he half-assed it on the house shows. He would give it his all on television, but he'd kind of go through the motions in the house shows. I can't even say he went through the motions no. here. He was half asleep for most of this match. And listen, it's the headbangers. They do not need their opponents to be half asleep. Brett didn't care. It made this match ten times worse, if that's even possible. This had to have been the worst match of his career. Sent this show careening off a cliff the last few minutes of this match were a nightmare i will have nightmares about this for years the last few minutes were worse than the first few minutes thrasher started off and gave the worst arm drag i've ever seen in my life only to tag in mosh which quickly took the leader in the worst arm drag i've never ever seen in my life okay i was thinking the same thing and as the two of you know, I am no fan of the Headbangers. I wasn't then. I sure as hell not now. But I watched them doing these terrible arm drags to Bret Hart. I thought, man, they're so bad. They make Bret Hart look bad. And then I thought about it. And it's been a long ass time since I've taken an arm drag. But then I remembered the guy taking the arm drag takes his own bump. It's true. The guy doing the arm drag is just kind of there. And I look close because there are many more arm drags to follow. Not as many as in the minis match, but quite a few arm drags. And I realized, Brett was just doing nothing. And I thought, you know, maybe this is not the headbanger's fault. And lo and behold, Davey Boy Smith tags in, and they're doing arm drags, and this dude's going head over feet, or he's flying through the air. It was Brett's fault. <laughs> Brett was worse than the headbangers in this match. Dude, there's not even a question. Yeah. Brett was so much worse than the headbangers. When Bret Hart came back to the WWE in... 2010 or whatever, the 2010s, whenever that was. He had a couple matches worse than this, like that one with Vince McMahon at WrestleMania, which consisted entirely of him hitting Vince McMahon with chairs. Yeah. But even those other matches where he wasn't allowed to take any bumps or do anything, they were still better than this match. It came time for him. They had the heat on one of the headbangers. And the comeback spot was he was going to miss his second rope elbow and they would do the double tag. First of all, he could barely even get up to the middle rope. He jumps off to miss the elbow. The headbanger moves. Brett lands on his feet. <laughs> gently places his elbow on the ground. This is no lie. Gets up with a totally blank expression. Strolls across the ring and tags in Bulldog. My work is done, he says. <laughs> it breaks into a four-way. You're being very generous by calling it work. <laughs> I couldn't tell you what was supposed to happen. But I am quite certain... That everyone was yelling at each other to get into position. No one was in position. At one point, they were doing a do -si do and I think Brett was supposed to switch and just forgot or didn't care. But it, the payoff was Brett Hart accidentally clipping the ref and taking out his knee. Mm -hmm. Brett has now gone beyond not caring. He just sits in the middle of the goddamn ring. He's sitting down. Davey White picks a uh, headbanger up for a power slam. And he looks, and Brett's in the middle of the ring. Davey's like, what the fuck, dude? See, this is Power Slam over there. There is no hyperbole in anything Vinny is saying right now. No, no. This is a factual statement. So the ref counts three after this Power Slam, but then declares, this is not the legal man. Keep that in mind, by the way. So that pin does not count. The match is restarted. Davey <laughs> Boy has to go get the American flag. They didn't even show, like, a replay <laughs> on the big screen. No. The storyline was the referee counted the pin and then immediately just changed his mind. Right. Yeah. Maybe that's why Brett didn't want to do this stupid match. 
So Davy Boy has to go get the flag, which is over by the fans, and the fans don't want to give it to him. He literally has to fight the fans away. He is swinging the heavy metal flagpole at the fans and banging into the guardrail. How he missed a couple of those fans, I have no idea. I bet he regrets it. <laughs> I mean, he's trying to hit him. <laughs> they get in the ring. They tear the American flag apart. This did not go over well. It turned into a giant brawl. Patriot and Vader ran out, and... Uh, Eventually, it was the they used the flag for the DQ, so that was the end of that, and that was I went minus three stars. The kindest thing that I could say about this was that it was horrifying. It was memorable. I am so happy I saw this. Minus three is a fair rating. <laughs> Thank you. And then who should run down afterwards? But a real life team of the Patriot and Vader. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What? You don't see Vader as patriotic? Well, no. He's an American Mastodon. He's from Colorado, dude. They both played college football. That's right. They both have things in their heads. Right. They both worked in Japan a lot. Team! And well, you know, when you put it that way, that's better than half the teams I've seen in wrestling over the last 20 years. This so, sucked. This is beyond awful. The last thing I want to say about this is actually before the match, and it's go it goes two things. They uh, do any of you know what public appearance at a major sporting event Daniel Bryan made this week? Hell no. Daniel Bryan threw out the first pitch at uh, the Phillies game at a Philadelphia Phillies baseball game. Right. So here I turn on Retro Raw, and what are the headbangers doing? They're at a Phillies game doing an angle with a Philly fanatic. That's right. Not a coincidence. Mosh. <laughs> Somebody is what listening to our show, watching what's happening on Raw weeks ahead, and planning this. So we get so someone watched this retro raw a month ago. So that's one of the Phillies. We gotta get somebody to throw a first pitch at the Phillies game. Somebody call Daniel Bryan right now. Yes, Mosh actually body slammed the Phillies mascot. The Philly fanatic. And the other footnote here is they can't play Chris Jericho's Pearl Jam Pearl Jam ripoff music in WCW, but they can play more human than human by White Zombie. Yeah, what's up with that? I don't know. I don't understand how this all works. But yeah, Bret Hart had the worst match of his career, and it's worth seeing just for that. That was raw. I think Brian's broken. Dude, I got nothing else to say about that match. What the hell do you want me to say? It sucked. We said it was minus three stars. Mm -hmm. Said it was the worst match of Brett's career. Yeah. Horrible. Yes. Horrible. Is that better? That's better. Monday Night Raw, number 226, September 22nd, 1997. They were in Madison Square Garden, and they wanted to do a history video. But this history video fe featured Hulk Hogan... Roddy Piper, Randy Savage, and Scott Hall. That's a problem. That is a problem, but they went with it. <laughs> they just let it go. Rocky Maivia versus Ahmed Johnson, Johnson in an Intercontinental Title Tournament match. You know what, though, Vinny? When you look at this show, <laughs> and you look at the names on this show, what great Madison Square Garden. I guess they had Shawn Michaels, the latter match. They had Shawn and Brett and Owen. Sure, but I mean... You gonna put Farouk and Kama in this video? You just you do the seventies, up to Backland, <laughs> and then you skip fifteen years. Huh? Duh. Well, that's not what they did. No. Sergeant Slaughter comes out. He ejects the Nation of Domination. Crowd is passionately telling Rocky that he sucks. You know what's funny about that? I think that people are misremembering history, because we talked about this before the Rock turned heel. There were not loud Rocky Sucks chants like this. No. No. The people are chanting Rocky Sucks and everything after the guy's a heel. There, there were pockets of backlash. There were pockets and they were very, 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 very mild. Yeah. This was not like Roman Reigns today. Absolutely not. Not even in the same and universe. nothing like John Cena's had for the past decade. No, he was just basically a babyface. So there were some fans, they didn't like him and they wanted him to die. But it was not an overwhelming reaction minor threat. until he turned heel. Now they're chanting. Now that he has Rocky turned, sucks. they're mad at him. Can you imagine if it was 2016, would they be chanting about his gyno? Dude. It was out of control. All right, get this in this tournament, which we shall break down in great detail later. Ken Shamrock beats Farouk in the first round. Beats him. Wins and advances. But in the process, he is injured and cannot continue. He's out of the tournament. He has a punctured lung. They punctured lung. So they just put Farouk back in. 
Right. Didn't even have like a second chance match where you had to beat somebody. No, just you lost, but he's injured, so you get to go ahead, go ahead and advance. You know, I don't know anything about sports, except that I've got the number one book in sports on audible.com, but when you do a tournament in a normal sport, don't you usually have like a couple of bonus matches or whatever? So if something goes wrong in the tournament, you've got alternates that go in. The uh, Mariners are making a run for something called the wild card. In but there's such thing right in, as an alternate, right? Isn't that the idea? I, I watch team sports, and there, if your star gets hurt, your team just advances with whatever they can field. Um, if, I don't know how it would work in tennis or golf, for example. Tennis, huh. tennis would be the best comparison. But I, I'm almost positive if you lose, you don't just get to go back in. I'd think so. Hmm. Well, I will have more to say about this tournament later. So, Ame gets thrown outside, and I don't want to alarm you, but he hurt himself. <laughs> Cut his hand open, bleeding everywhere. They're listing his long, long catalog of injuries. Jerry Lawler just says, he's injury prone. He should retire. Hey, he called it. So Rocky worked him over for a bit, and Ahmed hit the Pearl River plunge out of nowhere for the win, so he advances. Yeah, he advances to a match with Farouk. <laughs> They're wrestling again. Along with Good God Almighty. Along with Ahmed's multiple... Knee pads, elbow pads, thigh pads. He's now put in a humongous knee brace. Sure. You guys, you guys won't understand this, but those those of you that do jujitsu will know what I'm talking about here. Ahmed Johnson was every white belt you've ever seen. He had one speed, which was 100 miles an hour. He had no sense of pacing. He had no understanding of energy expenditure. That's why he was blown up all the time. Mm -hmm. Everything he did was with every ounce of his being. And it wasn't like he was any good. No. He was terrible. <laughs> He's fucking huffing and puffing and he could barely breathe. And then they go to the finish and he we just wanted a million miles an hour. The finish came out from literally out of nowhere. Yeah. There was no build up to it. He was just like. He I was know, a he was very just... bad professional wrestler. Fair enough. The announcers, announcers were running down the show when Steve Austin appeared in the crowd cutting a promo. Allegedly, you could barely see him in this mass of humanity, but we heard Austin's voice and he promised to whip someone's ass tonight. Yeah, they brought up that there's a restraining order out against Steve Austin. Owen Hart has one. And I thought, so we're not going to have any follow-up on what happened last week when he violated the restraining order and the police went walking after him and we never found out what happened? This is out of their jurisdiction now. I guess. <laughs> it goes, they did not leave uh, the Moines or wherever they were. All right. This next segment is more important than I think you guys realize. This is where it has to be. This is where Matt Hardy got the idea for Broken Matt Hardy. Sable is playing laser tag with Howard Finkel, who is calling her out while doing like introductions and stuff. And then, this is when I figured it out, Freddie Blassie's floating head appeared. Just like Vanguard 1. Freddie Blassie's floating head explained to Sable that she was playing laser tag with Howard Finkel and Howard was shooting her and she was shooting back and then we were promised there'd be more of this next week. Yeah. Yeah. I'm excited. <laughs> You're the one. <laughs> they showed highlights from One Night Only in the UK. So here's the deal. And they set all this straight up. Davy Boy Smith came out with his cancer-stricken sister. Dedicated the match to his cancer-stricken sister. Led her to the, sit with, the, with other members of his family, and they watched him main event the show in the UK. Then Shawn Michaels came out and beat him with a figure four. That's what happened. Mm -hmm. For those of you unaware of this story, the Bulldog was supposed to win, which was why they did all of this with the cancer-stricken sister, who did in fact pass away shortly thereafter. But Shawn showed up and decided that he don't lay down for nobody. Anywhere. No matter how cancer-stricken their sister might be. And so he won. She was devastated. Not his finest moment, Craig. Not his finest moment. What a shithead. <laughs> he was I mean that in the ass. nicest way possible. Actually, I don't. What a shithead. Yeah. It's a bad time in his life. I think that today, Shawn Michaels would look back and say, you know what? I was a shithead. So afterwards, uh, Sean is not releasing the figure four. Davy Boy's wife, Diana, tries to get him to release the hold. 
China goes after Diana, and so her brothers, Brett and Noah and Hart, run out to make the save. Something I want people to remember, too, as we continue on reviewing all of these shows. Shawn Michaels decided he was not going to lay down for anybody, including the Bulldog here on this special night. Let's just keep that in mind when we learn later who Shawn Michaels loses this title to and under what circumstances. Because surely all of you are thinking, this must have set up quite the championship change down the line if Sean felt it was so important to retain this title on this evening. How can the first European championship reign ever come to an end? Undertaker comes out for a promo. Vince makes it very clear this cell is going to have a roof. It's going to have a locked door. We will search under the ring to make sure nobody's hiding there. There will be no interference in Hell in the Cell. Taker is sure to mention he wants Brett's title, but first he's going to take care of Sean. He's going to enjoy watching Sean's rotting corpse. Sean comes out to cut a promo on the ramp, and this was amazing. He comes out on stage and maybe a, maybe a quarter of the way down the ramp. He's got a mic, and he's cutting this promo, and he's constantly turning backwards from, from side to side. He's looking to the fans to his left, looking to his, the fans on his right, and he's turning back constantly. And the reason he's doing this because like every third turn, he will just turn all the way around because that's the only way he can see himself on the big screen. That is exactly what happened. The lengths he had to go to <laughs> to see himself on this big TV. I could not believe my eyes. It was like Vince said, this fucker keeps looking at himself in the Titan Tron. <laughs> so this week, he's going to come out on the ramp with his back to the Titan Tron. That should solve this problem. Little did he know. Sean would just turn around. Yes. Look at himself in the Titan Tron anyway. Gets worse later. This was the period, by the way, that Shawn Michaels, for a six-month period or so, was much larger than Triple H. Yes. That right is... around the time his hair started falling out. That is also true. Crazy. This is amazing. He had been doing this by this point as a headliner in the main event stage of the biggest company in the world for years. Wouldn't the thrill of seeing yourself on a big TV eventually wear off? No. Because every time was the first time. Apparently not. So he cut a great promo, to be honest. But he's getting so much more big and strong. I guess so. Got to monitor it on that big Titantron. Said he was going to take care of Undertaker at Hell in the Cell. I'll bring the pain, Undertaker. All you have to do is show up. It was a good promo. It was a very good promo. Sonny came out to do ring announcing for the Legion of Doom versus Farouk and Kama. <laughs> this actually was so much better than I expected. They were working their asses off. Huh. He didn't think so? They went two minutes and 30 <laughs> seconds. Hey, was that DQ. was a hell of a 2.30. All I know is, on the Running, one hand... jumping. On the one hand, Kama could throw some really high kicks for a big man. They weren't good high kicks, but they were high. So yes, in less than three minutes, the nation attacked for the DQ. Ahmed ran, ran out with his bandaged hand and tried to make the save, but they were still outnumbered. Geeks ran out to separate them, and that was that. They showed Jimmy Snuka jumping out the top of the cage onto Don Morocco in 1983. Owen Hart versus Brian Pillman in the Intercontinental Championship Tournament. Man. <laughs> there is so much to talk about here. Man, oh man. It's day 16. Of? How uh, long he's kidnapped her for. Oh, Marlena. Yeah. Every day she comes out, she's wearing less. Mm -hmm. Tits everywhere. Right. Short skirt. Very short. Shoot up the skirt every time she gets in the ring. And they note that Marlena and Goldust will be renewing their vows on October 6th. Mm-hmm. That didn't happen. No. October 6th was bad blood, right? The day after. The day after. The day after. Yeah, that didn't happen. But that tells you where they were going. Mm -hmm. You could see the storyline here. Yes. So Pillman is dragging her out there. He also, his arm is, is in a sling. And he cuts a promo saying, I'm afraid the wrestling world has been robbed of what would have been a classic battle. Last night he explained, he had Marlena, and this is virtually a quote. No, this, I wrote the quote down. You All want right. the quote? Give me the quote. I had her bent over for that final position. That's what he said. He's mm -hmm. also sure to say she was squealing like a pig. <laughs> did I, did I, have I talked about his lack of subtlety? <laughs> I had her bent over 
for that final position. And squealing like a pig. In with, the bathtub. A very specific reference. Yes. And <laughs> final position, which means there was more before that. That's true. Yeah. That's true. In the bathtub. Well, that's where you finish off and you can shower right after. You haven't married the longest. So. <laughs> what does that have to do with the price of tea in China? <laughs> what I don't in, know. Uh... More experience with romance. <laughs> I see. Yeah. So he explained he slipped in the and fell in the bathtub and broke his arm. He was being forced to forfeit. Okay, keep this in mind. Brian Pillman wanted to forfeit and went out of his way to fabricate a story about a fake injury to forfeit. That was his goal, was to lose. Mm -hmm. Owen was hysterical here. Like checking on Owen's uh, uh, Pillman's arm and shoulder. He just shrugs and says, that's too bad. <laughs> that's just too bad. He says, you got to do what you got to do. Yes. Slaughter comes out to verify this injury is legit. And he tosses Pillman the mic, and Pillman catches it with a bad arm. Well, first, it's just classic. Sarge says, where's the x-rays? And Brian Pillman, whose gimmick is he's just, he's so smooth. Mm. He's as unsmooth as he's ever been. Oh, the x-rays? Uh, they're in my car. Uh, where's the, where's your doctor's note? That's in the hotel room. And then Sarge says, think fast. He throws the mic, and Pillman catches it with a bad arm. Busted. Right. So, Sarge says, you two are going to wrestle tonight, or you will never wrestle in the WWF again. So it's Brian Pillman versus Owen Hart. Now, two minutes ago, Brian Pillman wanted to lose. It was his goal. Why did he not just lie down and let Owen pin him? Well, the answer is because that would have been no fun. Why did he not just submit as soon as Owen grabbed a headlock? The fake wrestling match that they had... I don't think I've ever been so angry to see a show go to commercial. <laughs> <laughs> they were having the best fake match yeah. I've ever seen. Highlighted by Brian Pillman covers Owen Hart. Owen Hart kicks out at two. Brian Pillman says to the ref, that was a three. And then Owen Hart says to the ref, that was a three. I was like, please keep going. Please. And then they go to commercial. Well, you were the one who was amused. Oh, man, I loved it. Most fans were chanting boring. <laughs> who gives a shit about that? Vince was outright saying, can we please go to break? So they go to break, and then during the break, they couldn't even do this on the live shot. Marlena had hit Owen with a purse. Owen had turned around and seen the purse in Pillman's hands. He got pissed, and they actually started fighting. So now Pillman wants to win. After spending all day concocting the story. Well, now he's mad. So they're doing this match. And very quickly, Goldust runs out, punches Owen one time, then turns and attacks Pillman, who's the guy he really has a problem with. The refs hold Goldust down. Pillman grabs Marlena and flees. So at the end of the day, Pillman got what he wanted. Eventually. He got sure. the girl, and he lost the match. Owen cuts a promo, saying yes, he'd won. He was in the finals, and he owed it all to Brett. So I went back to check. This tournament is five matches old. Five out of seven when all is said and done. Three DQs. One guy lose and then get back in due to the, other, the person who beat him getting hurt. And one match delayed for a week because one of the participants wanted to have sex. <laughs> yeah. I guess this was the delay. This tournament sucks. <laughs> it sure fucking does. This is one of the all-time worst. Now, I won't spoil this for you, but we ain't done yet. So Owen says he owes everything to Brett and his fans back in Canada, and then Austin hits the ring and lays him out. God, did he waffle him from behind. <laughs> <laughs> Just killed a guy. Stomping a mud hole in him. Owen flees. Austin's having a face-off with security. And Vince McMahon says it's time to take charge. Vince gets in the ring. Tries to calm everyone down. So security's on one half of the ring. Austin's in the other. And he's pacing back and forth. And Vince is trying to talk to reason with him. He says, I know why you're upset. You've had your Intercontinental Championship stripped. You've had your Tag Team Champion stripped. I know why you're upset, but you can't break the law. Your own doctor said you are not fit to compete. We, the WWF, cannot stand by and watch you paralyze yourself. Everyone wants to see you compete, but in due time. We care about you, Steve. You just have to go with that. You just have to work within the system. Austin took all this in. Vince is such a great storyteller. <laughs> you know what I mean? He's got all these numbskulls on TV nowadays trying to tell his stories. 
because yeah. he doesn't want to be on TV anymore. And nobody can do it like he could. He was great here. Oh, yeah. Austin, Austin was also great because he was actually listening to Vince and it was he made the the facial of, of oh, I, I, I'm, I'm trying. I, I understand. I understand you're looking out for my best interest for just a second. This speech, by the way, is probably a speech Vince has given to dozens of guys over the years. Probably Brett and Sean. Probably Brett and Sean. Earlier in the day. Yes. So Austin explains, look, this is what I do for a living. I am the best in the world of this. I appreciate that you care. And I also appreciate that you can kiss my ass. And he drops Vince with a historic and very terrible stunner. This was the first of many horrible stunners <laughs> that Vince would take in his career. You mean I'll top this on the terrible scale? Oh, I don't know, Vinny. <laughs> this man was incapable of taking a stone cold stunner. We shall see. All you have to do is drop to your knees. <laughs> yes. That's fucking it. <laughs> so Vince tells this like he's having a seizure. The cops are actually cuffing Austin. Place is going nuts, chanting Austin's name. Austin stops to uh, with his, with his hands cuffed behind his back, flip Vince off, and they lead him away. Lawler and Austin are screaming. There's no way Austin can keep his job now. This is an amazing segment. Dude, I'll say. You know, trivia time. What was the last big time bump that Vince McMahon had taken prior to this? Anybody know? Had it ever happened? It had happened. I actually remembered this. I have no idea. I got nothing. I believe it was the night that Ric Flair debuted and Roddy Piper accidentally whacked Vince McMahon, the commentator, with a wooden chair. Ah. 1991. This was 1997. Point of this is, Vince had not been involved in a physical altercation or taken a big-time bump in six years. That's why this was so legendary. That's why when you watch the show today... And they do the same shit every single week and nobody cares. Because it's impossible to. Yeah. Like, I mean, the fact that I could remember the previous bump Vince McMahon took in 2016 without even looking it up, I remembered this. I can't even tell you what was on Raw this week. Had a memorial graphic for Dick Bulldog Brower. So then it's time for hour two. The pyro goes off and they go to the announce desk. And there's it's a three-man desk. And Ross is on one side, Lawler is on the other side, and the middle is where Vincent Mann should be. But he's not there, of course. He has been stunned. So the announcers are talking and running down the show. Meanwhile, between them, right where Vincent Mann's head would normally be, <laughs> was an enormous rack in a tight top with high beams on. Mm. Not an accident, of course. Upgrade. A huge upgrade. It was Rhonda Shear. They replaced one boob with two. Oh, there you go. It was Rhonda Shear, who, if you don't remember her, she had a I USA do. show. Up uh, all night. I don't know if the millennials would, but yes, we do. But uh, Of course they wouldn't. <laughs> they were in bed. <laughs> exactly. We were up all night. That is true. Like that the All Night Express. <laughs> we were up all night expressing. <laughs> yeah, good times. <laughs> Craig doesn't know what to do right now. No, I know what to do. I just want to bite my tongue. All right. I love when I can shut Craig down. <laughs> no, I have something Which horrible to say, hard so to I'm do. not going to. <laughs> so she, of course, was interviewed to plug her show and whatever. Then it led to Hunter Hearst Helmsley versus Dude Love was the scheduled match. Hunter's music plays. There was a pause. Cactus Jack's music briefly played, but no one really knew what it was. It went away. Then Dude Love's music plays, but Dude appears on the screen. And as dude's cutting this promo, first of all, in a brief aside, at some point, Mick Foley, as the GM of Raw in 2016, needs to do a bit as Dude Love with the New Day. Just me? All right. So Dude Love is doing this promo. Of all people, Vinny hates Dude Love. And how he wants to see Dude Love with the New Day. It's just a perfect match, though. Huh. So Dude is explaining that he is a man of love, and this Falls Count Anywhere match, there's no love involved. Too much anger and violence. It's not his bag. So he has another man in mind for this match. A kind man. Mankind. And they do the green screen trick. And it was awesome because they were like high fiving and stuff. And Mankind comes in. And his, now his music is playing. And the place is all cheering. And mankind says, You know, first of all, dude, you're a great looking man. But while I am a violent and deadly man, I know someone even more violent and deadly myself 
who would love this opportunity to wrestle Hunter Hearst Helmsley in Madison Square Garden. His name is Cactus Jack. Everyone goes crazy. Cactus Jack appears between the two of them. He's clutching a garbage can. He declares that Mrs. Foley's baby boy is coming home to Madison Square Garden. First ever appearance by Cactus Jack in WWE. And this is one of those moments where I remembered it vividly. And I knew exactly where it was going. And when Jack finally walked out of that curtain, even though I knew it was going to happen, I still got chills like you wouldn't believe. It's crazy. You're right. I don't believe it. But you know what? This match was great. Yeah, it was. Cactus Jack making his Madison Square Garden debut after all these years. A legit dream come true. When they push dreams coming true in WWE about like the SmackDown women's title that's been around for never, I don't buy it. When Mick Foley, who they showed in this building watching Jimmy Snuka fly off fall off a case just a few months ago, and after all the years and all the violence and all the pain and agony he went through as Cactus Jack, and Cactus Jack finally comes through that curtain and everyone goes nuts. Oh, what a moment. Then they had a great match. Cactus is beating the hell out of Hunter. China hit him, and of course Foley, well, A, he was a pro anyway, but he also loved China, so he sold his ass off for her. They brawled backstage briefly just so Cactus can get a fire extinguisher and blast Hunter with that. He tried a middle rope elbow. An elbow from the middle rope to the floor. Hunter dodges. They had a trash can there to kind of, sort of, a little bit break his fall, but not much. All kinds of weapon shots. Cactus is a sunset flip from the apron to the floor, which causes King to cry out, What a stupid move! So China goes after Cactus with a chair. He no-sells it, but Hunter hits him from behind, which sends Cactus and China into the steps. China is now taken out. They're brawling up the ramp. All this carnage and violence. Hunter tries to win with a crucifix cradle on the ramp. That made me laugh. Crowd's change for ECW. Eventually, the Hunter gets a uh, table, goes for a pedigree on the table, but Cactus nut-punches him, pile drives him through the table, and gets the win. It was a really great match. It was a really great moment. And these same two dudes would have a much better hardcore match in the same building just over two years later. A couple of things. First off, Cactus at one point did a sunset flip off the apron on the Triple H, where he took the hardest bump of the night, and Triple H just had to roll back onto his shoulders. <laughs> Smartest man in wrestling, I thought. <laughs> China, when she got wiped out, I thought, oh my god, Foley just killed her. She looked like she'd been just destroyed, being smashed against the steps. Only in pro wrestling do they then take another angle that makes it very clear she's totally fine and put it on television. There were way too many hard shots to the head. But with all that said, when this match was over, I thought, you know, there's a lot of things on Raw that are great. Like, Bret Hart is very entertaining. Sean is entertaining. There's a lot of good stuff on here. But it's never as exciting as Nitro. Nitro's, there's always something exciting going on. This was this match I watched and I was like, you know what? If I were a fan, just watching this for the first time, this is one of the first things I've seen in a while where it's like, this show is way more exciting than Nitro. This show is awesome. This match was so crazy and wild that it outdid the wild, crazy show on the other channel. I can't even remember another match they've done of late that's not on pay-per-view that was as wild and crazy as this one. And they've had... Foley wrestling matches on this show. There was something about this one that was just so cool. It was cool because there was a lot of ECW regular fans in the crowd. You could see the, you know, the regulars that are in the ECW arena were actually at MSG. They brawled into the crowd at one point and uh Mankind or excuse me, Cactus whipped Hunter into the barricade. The barricade actually fell down and flew up. You could see Pat Patterson trying to grab the guardrail, keep it down so uh, it wouldn't hit the fans in the front row. Um, crowd brawling, violence, um, that table, how it didn't break when they both got up on top of it because it was bowing like crazy. Uh, this was just a perfect match in the uh, perfect town. They showed garden moments. Andre the Giant body slamming Big John Studd at WrestleMania 1. What I noticed here made me laugh is that before the body slam, Andre softened, softened him up with a series of leg kicks. We tie Andre the Giant. Who knew? They recapped Sean beating Davey Boy in England. 
Sean comes out for a promo. He calls out Taker to be slapped around. They go to break. When they come back, Sean is still out there, still calling out Taker, and also insisting to the fans that he was not gay. So Taker shows up, does his power walk down to the ring. Hunter comes to jump Taker from behind. Taker sees that guy, but then Sean whacks him with a chair. Rick Rude and China are there. They're all putting the boots to Taker. If you go back and watch this, it sounds like every other beatdown you've ever seen in wrestling. Fans, grown women, had their hands over their mouths, eyes wide, screaming in terror. And when Sean went to grab a chair from the crowd and had to fight people to get it away from them, wrestling has changed, man. Wrestling has just changed. Dude, it's a sad day. And then they're stomping a mud hole in the guy, and he fights back, and four heels yes. flee from one dead guy. Uh -huh. Right. Why is it so hard nowadays? And now you're thinking, why? And you're thinking, if I buy that pay-per-view, I'll see the main heel in a cell where he can't run away. That's right. He cannot run away and he cannot get any help. And he can't get it's any help. one-on-one -on -one in a cell. He's, this man's dead. You know, what's coming to him? God, right. this was so easy. Right before this segment, they had a commercial for the Karate Fighters Presents WWF Survivor Series, which means... Time for round two? It's almost time for round two. It's coming. When do we do it? December? I think we did it in November. November? Man. Hmm. Who won? It was Vinny, right? No, it was Craig. Was it you? <laughs> yeah. I don't remember. Putting into that. I seem to recall losing quickly twice. I recall winning. Of course you do. <laughs> did I not? No. Huh. It's rigged. So, Bret Hart versus Goldust was the main event. <laughs> Dude, this was like... It was not... In the same universe as bad as Brett's match last week? This one, like, nine minutes. Mm -hmm. Six minutes was Brett just taking his leg apart. Mm -hmm. And then Goldust did a big comeback. And then he got submitted with a sharpshooter working over the leg. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This was a solid professional wrestling encounter. And there was nothing sexy about it. No. Till it was over, Craig. No. And the fans didn't Your like... boy HBK ran in. His fans were He's not... boy too, you know. Shirtless. Fans were not into this at all. Hairy and sweaty. There was a point where Brett hooked the figure four around the post, <laughs> and Earl Hebner is telling him, break the hold, Brett, break the hold. And Brett said, why? <laughs> and Earl had no answer. So, yes, the crowd was, after all the insanity they had seen this evening, with the, the lead commentator, who was secretly the owner getting stunned in the wild brawl with Cactus and... Uh, uh, Triple H, they were not into this fight here between two guys who had no issue with each other and nothing on the line. Sean came out to be on the ramp and steal all the attention. The fans were way more into chanting homophobic, homophobic slurs at Sean than anything going on in the ring. Goldust did make his comeback after about three hours and then Brett tapped him out with a sh sharpshooter. Sean zoomed in and started brawling with Brett. Led to all the Heart Foundation, all of what would become DX coming out. And then Taker comes out to clear the ring, and it comes down to him. He's just throwing guys out one at a time, one at a time, one at a time. And he turns around, and Sean, or Brett, Sean and Brett are going at it. And he walks up and grabs them each by the neck and chokes them, choke slams them at the same time. And that's that. Oh, that was a great show. It's pretty good. Bulldog selling the leg. Hideous. Hideous. And oh my god, Nightheart. <laughs> this guy waddling in to get what involved. About, what about Shamrock running down the ramp with a punctured lung? Dude. Is he out there? Yeah. I didn't even know to see that. <laughs> Monday Night Raw, number 227, September 29th, 1997. Vincent Mann brings Shawn Michaels down to the ring for a promo. Shawn is accompanied by his new buddies Hunter Hearst Helmsley in China and their bodyguard Rick Rude. Now, no one ever used the words Degeneration X here, but this may as well have been the DX debut because this is the first time that Shawn and Hunter... We're doing the junior high wise ass gimmick. Rude is giving a promo talking about protection services, how Vince McMahon can have his protection too for the right price. As Sean and Hunter are giving Vince bunny ears, they're flicking his ear, they're mugging for the camera, the camera, they're goofing off and amusing themselves. They clearly realized that this Rick Rude character sucked and they wanted nothing to do with him. That's pretty true. It was a really weird fit. And they didn't have to worry about it for long. No. So Vince outright called Sean a wise ass, asked him about Hell in the Cell. 
Sean dropped the words Triple H on camera for what I believe for the first time. Said last week, he and his buddies had beaten Undertaker like nobody ever had before. And no one said DX, but Sean did give out one try at a new nickname. Triple H and HBK, the initial outlaws. That didn't last. This name was said once, never brought it to life again. Well, they also kept using the term The Click. That's true. Which was, in fact, what they were going to call Degeneration X before they hit upon Degeneration X. I'd like to add, by the way, as you noted, Vince interviewed these men. Vince was killed with a Stone Cold Stunner a week ago. Yes. All the way back in 1997, Vince was just too tough. Oh, yeah. I also liked... This is getting ahead of ourselves, but on several occasions during the show, Steve Austin said that Vince had a neck like a stack of dimes. I, I, at least twice. At least two different people mentioned that about Vince. So that is where Vince got it when he then told Randy Orton that he had a neck like a stack of dimes. Mm -hmm. When Randy was hurt and came back very skinny. Yes. And he's never been that skinny again, I might add. Well, no. So... Sean says this is Triple H's chance to get everything off his chest. And Hunter says that in a voice two octaves two octaves higher than what he, how he sounds in 2016, he has been sitting on the back burner in the WWF as they have, quote, spread their legs like a cheap whore for everyone else, highlighting a bunch of goofs who weren't worthy of tying his boots. He promised that Vince would never get rid of this click. He goes to grab the mic, and Vince won't let him. Hey. <laughs> Old school announcers, do not relinquish control of the microphone. Yeah. Gene did the same thing. The fucking giant would try to grab the microphone from Gene, and Gene would have none of it. Vince says, I'll hold the mic, thank you. So Slaughter comes out. He's doing his promo. Sean is wiping the spit off his face, hiding behind the European title, and checking himself out on the Tron, of course. So they're being goofs and making a joke out of everything and slaughter books hunter against the undertaker and the mood changes and now they are outraged and furious and not joking the heart foundation comes out warns them they will be punished for their crimes against the hearts and at this threat sean and hunter did the slack jawed double take video that would go on to be used in a million dx hype packages you know what's funny about this whole sean michaels thing him and hunter here First off, Hunter is like every 40-something-year-old today who spent the last 20 years trying to figure out how they can be as cool as Shawn Michaels and failing. These guys, Shawn had so much heat at this point in his career. Now, granted, he deserved it, but his on-screen character, that's the point. That's the point of the Shawn Michaels heel character. He was supposed to be so annoying that you were begging for somebody to just beat his ass. So he was very effective at it. This is not taking away from the fact that someone should have beat his ass. Well, but, Brett did. Yeah. there There is an aspect to it where, I don't know, that was his job. Yeah, of course. He went from being the top babyface to the top heel. And I realized that on the other channel, the top heels were babyfaces. Yes. But he was... A, an old school worker who at least understood if I'm a bad guy, I'm supposed to be disliked. Right. And boy, was he good at it. Oh, yeah. People wanted oh. to kill him. Yes. Including guys in the back. Yes. He was doing his job. Well, speaking of Sean deserving a beating, they replayed him, defeat, or replayed him defeating Davy Boy Smith for the European title in London. And they showed his post-match promo where he asked the limeys in the crowd to take a look at their champion. Called out Diana Smith, went after Bulldog again. This brought Diana into the ring, which brought China after Diana, and Brett and no one arrived to clear everyone away. You know, there's been a little debate about this thing. Mostly one guy. It's, on really, the it's one guy. But, like, if your argument is that it made no sense for Sean to lose to Davy Boy before Hell in a Cell, then my argument would be well, why'd you book the match then? Yes. What the fuck did you make this match for if you don't want Shawn Michaels to lose before Hell in a Cell? Yes. So if you made the match, go do the job. Yeah. Either either do the job or get the hell out of here. This is not up for debate. So we got Davey Boy Smith versus Vader. 
announcers were falling all over themselves to let you, let you, the viewer, know that, yes, Davy Boy's sister is battling cancer. We wish her well. So the funny thing is, it's the Hart Foundation versus everyone. Davy Boy is the hated foreigner coming out waving the English flag. Vader is the American who is going to fight for this flag in a flag match at the pay-per-view in six days. He put this whole thing together like Davy Boy was the babyface. So this didn't work. Vader hits a Vader bomb. Heart Foundation attacks with a DQ. Dude, can we talk about when Vader took a front first suplex on the guardrail? That happened. Oh, 400 pound God. man landed on his belly on a very firm, very narrow piece of metal. I bet that sucked. And there was another spot where I think he was coming off the top or something and Davy Boy gave him a power slam. That sounds right. But Vader landed right on his ass. Yeah. Now, I know we talk about how the ring apron, the hardest part of the ring, and how this is horse shit because the storyline should be that the whole ring is the hardest part of the ring. Let me tell you something. Back then, until Vince McMahon got in the ring, the middle was the hardest part of the ring. That ring didn't give at all. And Vader landing ass first in the middle of the ring? Dude, that guy should have retired right there. That looks so horrible. So Hart Foundation worked over Vader. Patriot tried to make the save. They kicked his ass too. They put them both in the ring post figure four and then left them draped in the Canadian flag. That's a true story, by the way. WWF had the hardest ass rings for decades. And then Vince McMahon starts wrestling and he's like, God damn, this ring is hard. They had fucking whole new rings made. Yeah. Amazing how that works. It's not amazing. It's just like, hey, you never were in one. He was in one all the time. I know. He just never fell down in one. They kept cutting to a back door. This is like the third or fourth time they've shown it already. They said, we promise you at some point, Steve Austin will walk through this door. Watch this show, everyone. You will get to see Steve Austin walk in this door. Don't turn the channel. Steve Austin is going to walk through a door. You'll be stunned to hear that people were turning the channel all night from this show. And I'm sure you'll be equally stunned to find out when the largest turnoff occurred. They plugged the one night only replay, including, did you notice in this highlight package from the show? A Godwin, I think it was Henry, although I can't be sure, sure. But a Godwin actually took the doomsday device from the Road Warriors, including the full flip over landing on his belly. That's how Henry Godwin broke his neck like two months before this. Ballsy. Insane. Yeah. Ahmed Johnson versus Farouk in the semifinals of one of the worst tournaments there's ever been. I gotta talk about Ahmed. His hand's all fucked up mm -hmm. because he got hurt last week. Yeah. Okay, for once in his life, yes. this was not his fault. I know. There was like a nail, an exposed nail. A sharp, pointy, stabby nail. And <laughs> he gashed himself and like on the announce desk oh my he's on God. the floor and he like he leans over put his hand on it to balance himself and nail goes through his hand this poor guy so he comes out with the lod and ken shamrock to back him up against the uh nation of domination now keep in mind they let him wrestle this match yeah <laughs> so farouk is working the hand you haven't lived until you've seen Ron Simmons throwing judo chops to the bandaged hand of Ahmed Johnson. Ahmed makes this terrible comeback. He hits Farouk with the stairs, and he takes out the ref. He is disqualified. Everyone brawled afterwards. So I went back and did the math. There's eight matches in this tournament. Or excuse me, eight men in this tournament, so seven matches. We've now seen six of them. Of those six matches, four have been DQs. One has seen a guy lose and then get back in due to injury. One was delayed because one of the participants was too busy having sex. And all of this is to set up a final at the pay-per-view of Owen Hart versus Farouk. Serious question. If Ahmed Johnson screwed his hand up and needs surgery, why couldn't he just be beaten? <laughs> I don't know. Why couldn't he be pinned if he's clearly going to be out of action for an extended period of time? Unless they're just going to make him wrestle every week, which I don't think they're going to do because he was the one who was going to go to the finals. I don't have an answer. I got another question. No? If you're as horrible as Ahmed Johnson, 
I don't know what move to give you, but that axe kick was so wild and out of control oh, yeah. and violent. I'd rather get in a real fight with somebody than have that guy hit that fake axe kick on me. Yep. Totally agree. Sable, having defeated Howard Finkel and Laser Tag, now had to beat the Headbangers. She did this by outsmarting them and getting them to shoot each other. Then they fought. Doesn't sound hard. They're outsmarted by Sable. Vince then introduced a disturbing piece of videotape, as he called it, that might not be suitable for all, all members of the family. It was Brian Pillman's Triple X Files. Pillman was in bed with Marlena. He was sure to note that he was tired. In fact, he was licked and bushed. But he was still bringing us this edition of the Triple X Files. You know what's so great about Pillman is he's another guy who knew I'm a bad guy and I need to be disliked. Yeah. Now, he was so entertaining that he should have been basically a babyface. But he was able to be so goddamn slimy that he was still dislikable. He was very talented. He was an amazing man. This was his last week. This was his last appearance, unless he did one of the, like, shotgun or one of the B shows in the weekend. This was his last appearance on a wrestling show. Crazy. Sucks. He said that he would uh, not fight Dude Love at Bad. He would not fight Dude Love at Bad Blood, unless he was he was promised protection from Gold Dust. He wanted Gold Dust handcuffed to the ring post, making sure to note that they'd have to find their own handcuffs because his were already being used. But if they did protect him from Gold Dust, he was going to kick Dude's ass all over the ring. And they go to uh, the thing ends. They go back to Vince, and Vince says, "Well, I hope that's the last we see of Pillman's Triple X Files." There was that stipulation of so Gold Dust. Let me get this straight. Gold Dust is handcuffed to the post. And if Dude Love wins, mm -hmm. Gold Dust gets Pillman for five minutes. Yes. I wonder what they were going to do there. Because we know that Gold Dust and Marlena were renewing their vows the next day. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if. I wonder if Pillman was going to beat Dude Love, or if Dude Love was going to beat Pillman, and in the middle of the five minute battle. Marlena would accidentally trip up gold dust or something. Could and then they that. renew their bows. Could have done bow. that. Could have done that. Um, there's a bunch of things they could have done. So, Dude Love came out to do commentary for Gold Dust versus Sultan, who I cannot believe is still a thing. This. The Sultan. This, I'm sure, was the beginning of the Exodus. What a boring match. It was very boring. So here in the middle of this, they announced the five minutes uh, stipulation for the Pillman Dude Love match. They also very casually said, oh, uh, Steve Austin is in the building now. What about the damn door? What the, I missed the door. There was a door he was going to walk through. I missed that. Uh, as I wrote, a slow, boring match that went forever. Goldust won with a sloppy bulldog. Do you realize that you called it a Thor? Just like you used to call men Thorks? Like Thor? Yeah, there's something by the way door. you say Doe. Hmm. <laughs> I don't know. That's of how, all people, how I, say I it. am critical of your pronunciation of a word. That's how I say it, though. No. Yeah. Steve Austin comes out for a promo. Now, I understand he has merchandise to sell, but Steve Austin should not be wearing a baseball cap and jean shorts when he comes down to the ring. First, I thought he looks like a giant eight year old boy. That's what he wore forever. That's his outfit. There's something about this cap. The hunter's, the hunter's cap, the camouflage one he wears, that looks different. This one, he looked like a little kid. And at first I thought he looked like a giant eight-year-old boy, and then I realized, oh my god, it's worse. He looks like John Cena. So he comes out for this promo. He says, Vince, by the way, as soon as he came out, Vince was scared shitless at the announced desk. Have you watched The Raw this week? I have not. Man. I'm trying to figure out what I could have said here. I'm going to tell you. I'll remind you. There is a segment with a McMahon and a babyface. Oh, I know what you're talking about. The McMahon in question is Stephanie. Mm -hmm. The babyface in question is Mick Foley. Sure. I am concerned for your well-being, Vinny. I'm not sure you're going to make it over on Thursday. This is, this has to be the worst segment of 2016. 
In fact, it's up there with the worst segments I have ever seen in my whole entire life that don't involve something just completely tasteless. It's so bad. It's horrifying. It's appalling to me. It's atrocious. And when you watch it, for those of you that have already watched it, comparing that to the way that Steve Austin and Vince McMahon interacted, <laughs> where Vince McMahon is trying to lay down the law, but Steve Austin will have none of it. Yeah. He does not back down. He outright dares the man to fire him. Mm -hmm. Because you see, Steve Austin is a big star. Oh yeah. And Steve Austin does not have to say, you fire me, I'll be on the other show next Monday. He doesn't even have to say that. Every fan watching knows this goddamn guy could walk on a Nitro and be the biggest star there. Or, fuck it, he's got millions of dollars because he's a famous professional wrestler. He doesn't need this shit. Just wait till you watch Stephanie and Mick. And just please try not to quit this job. I shall do my best. Well, what happened here was Austin uh, calls Vince into the ring. Vince says, I am tired of your... Your, your uh, antics, Stone Cold. I'm going to put a stop to it right now. Austin dared Vince to fire him. And Vince said, well, one of three things is going to happen. One, you are going to bring a certificate from your doctor that says you were cleared to wrestle, and we both know no doctor is going to give that to you. Two, you are going to return to action, but you're going to sign a waiver clearing the WWF of all legal liability. Or three, I'm going to do what I have to do. And he stopped, and he waited, and he waited, and he finally muttered, in terms of termination. At which Jim Ross said, that sounds familiar. So Austin here became the second guy on the show to reference Vince's stack of dimes. He warned Vince, if you fire me in front of the world, I will beat your ass worse than ever. And they left it with the tease that one of these things would happen next week, and you have to tune in to see what happened. And Austin kept coming back to harassment man, and when he finally just laid in with a double middle finger, the crowd went nuts. The Headbangers wrestled Jesus and Jose of Los Bariquas. You're in the middle of a wrestling war, and you're getting your ass handed to you. And your bright idea, after a Steve Austin Vince McMahon segment, which, by the way, I'm sure the idea of the Vince McMahon Steve Austin segment was to attract viewers. So one would deduce that after that segment, you would put on another segment that would retain those viewers. Headbangers versus two random, faceless members of Los Bariquas in an 85-minute match that was every level of hell you can imagine. The exodus <laughs> from this show at this point was monumental. Yeah. Thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people stopped watching the show at this point. And I wonder if they woke up the next day and tried to figure out why. Why did people not want to watch Los Bariquas and the fucking Headbangers? So I've got a lot to say about this. The Bariquas were dressed like this was a street fight. And by that I mean the streets of Fairbanks, Alaska in the middle of a once-in-a-lifetime blizzard. Layers on layers on layers on layers on layers. They badly, badly, badly fucked up literally, literally the first thing they tried. And then the Barik was grabbed a headbanger and they hit him with one million moves in a row. When I say no one gave a shit about this match, I include not only all the fans at home, not only all the fans who turned the channel, not only the fans in the building, but I include the four men involved. If I had not seen that Bret Hart match two or three weeks ago, this would have been the lowest effort I've ever seen in a major wrestling match. It was so lifeless, so comically lifeless, I just started laughing. It was funny how half-assing they were. They weren't they were putting, I can't say zero effort. They were putting a one on a scale of one to ten into this match. They would just do a move, do a move, do a move, do a move, do a move. And these are cool moves, by the way. These aren't planches and topes. These are elbow smashes and stomps. I had to take a phone call in the middle of the match. And uh, and I do mean in the middle. And after the phone call, 
I was so tempted to start this from the beginning, just to experience its awfulness in one, one wow. solid sit through. Wow. I, I couldn't bring myself to do it. But I, I, I wanted to know what it was like to actually sit through this entire experience. So after, as you noted, 85 minutes of nothing, Mosh got a hot tag. He made a comeback for 15 seconds. Then they cut him off. They hit him with a top rope Rana. They had him beat, but the Godwins attacked for the DQ. Can you imagine? <laughs> now, Can you imagine on a fucking piece of paper it said Los Bariquas A and B? Because I'm certain Vince had no idea who any of these guys were. They actually did make the Jose and Jose B joke. Versus, which Vince laughed at uproariously. He did. Versus Headbangers. DQ, hog farmers run in. Don't forget, 85 minutes. Now let's think about this. I can't. No, I got more to say. I'm not done yet. As you all know, if you've been listening to this for any length of time, the Headbangers, in my opinion, are the worst team I've ever seen. And I stand by that. But it is also fair to say that they were booked to be the worst champions of all time. Again, they sold for 85 minutes. They made a 15-second comeback to Jose and Jesus of Los Periquas. They got their asses kicked again, and they were beaten, but hog farmers attacked them at random. This is the worst... I can't say the worst tag team championship reign. This is the worst championship reign I've ever seen. It is amazingly bad. There's nothing good about it. There are zero redeeming qualities. Well, I ain't gonna defend it. Owen Hart came out for a promo. He was accompanied by his personal security men in riot gear and big, giant, head-hiding helmets. This was where I fell in love with the show. <laughs> I love shit like this. Yes. Where it's so patently obvious yes. what's gonna happen. Yes. And the heel is so goddamn stupid that he can't figure it out. Swerves are not always good. No, they're, they're a waste of time. Mm -hmm. A swerve is good... When you don't see it coming, but it makes sense. Right. Which, in fact, was what this was. I suppose. I mean, I saw it coming. Yeah. I think most fans saw it coming. I mean, they had a perfectly... They had a shot of this dude standing there with this giant fucking helmet on his head. As, as, as Owen is talking about how Steve Austin will never get a hold of me. I have security here. It's like, it's so obvious. It was wonderful. As Dark Helmet is behind him. Wonderful. Now, I may be in the minority here. Owen Hart does not get enough credit for his absolutely astonishingly great promos. They're really not that great, but he's one of those guys where everything he says is funny. He reminds me of Norm MacDonald. Norm MacDonald is not like a great public speaker and he slurs his words sometimes and loses his train of thought. But every fucking word that comes out of his mouth is hilarious. It's just like Owen. Everything he said, even when he was trying to be serious, I thought was just so funny. But he wasn't trying to be funny. He wasn't trying to... He wasn't ruining wrestling. He wasn't just being a shithead. No. He's just... He's a guy who had just had funny delivery. He was great at being Owen Hart. Yes. And Owen Hart was, most of his career, not a main event guy, a top of the middle guy, whose job it was to make you dislike him, to be a bit of a geek so you didn't mind or even were in happy to see him when he got his ass beat. He was so great. I loved this promo. He said that he was as, as good as Farouk was. He, Owen Hart, was much better. He would still be the Intercontinental Champion if he had not shown compassion to Austin after breaking his neck. He vowed to beat Farouk at the pay-per-view, but said, Listen, I am a good man. I am a family man. I don't need to deal with a lunatic like Steve Austin. It is up to you, Vince, to make the right decision. Kick him out of this empire that your father started before he burns it to the ground. And he repeated this line about making the right decision about 17 times. He said he knew he, he would be there to see Austin get fired the night after bad blood. So two things before we get to the conclusion. Uh, 
we've noted how Bret Hart in 2016 is turning into Stu Hart. I saw flashes of Stu here as well. I know it's not a, not a shock. Sure. Owen looked like his dad. I know, breaking news. But I've never, yeah. I never noticed it until right here. Two, this actually happened like a couple weeks ago. He now has the, I don't even know how to describe it, but his horrible music that he had from here to the end of his career. It sucks. I just love a heel who has what he believes is a great idea. And he's so passionate about it. And you, the viewer, realize this guy is a goddamn idiot. He's a boob. Yeah. I loved it. Yeah. Back in the day where the heels were fucking idiots, and the baby faces were the ones who outsmarted everybody. <laughs> Almost every except time. Except on the rare occasion when they would be outsmarted, but then they would get their revenge. You never laughed at the main event heels, but you laughed at most of the heels. And you laughed at Owen here. I know this is... <laughs> Don't waste your time. <laughs> <laughs> we have to explain this because it's new to a lot of people. It, it can't be. They, they The show they're watching, they don't see it. Yeah, but they read stories. They watch <laughs> they read normal books television. And watch movies, yes. They watch sports. They <laughs> deal with life. All of these are true. I mean, you know what? It makes me glad they called the WWE Universe because it's nothing like our fucking universe. It's a goofy universe. Yeah, it sucks. So they play o Owen's terrible music. And, uh, of course... Suddenly, there's a security guy in the ring with his helmet off and a Steve Austin, and he stuns Owen. The other security guys are nice enough to stand and watch all this happening, and Austin leaves through the crowd. Now, speaking of comedy, they go to break, and Owen has been taken back to the Hart Foundation dressing room, where he is prone on a table, grabbing his neck in great pain. And the Hart Foundation has left Jim Neidhart in charge. You ever watch your cat look out the window and like watching birds? Oh, yeah. That is what Jim Neidhart was here. Head bob left, head bob right. Head bob up, head bob to the back. Yeah. Look at Owen, look up. You never know when a threat might come from any direction to ambush Owen Hart. Hey, let me mention one other thing about the stunner. Another thing I loved about Owen. With the exception of Vince, who just sucked, everybody would take the stunner, and especially as the years went by, they would take a more and more preposterous bump. My favorite being when Kurt Angle took the stunner in that one pay-per-view where they were unifying the two titles. Yes. And he just stood straight up in the air and took a flat-back bump. I watched it a million times. It was the timing that made that one great. Oh, it was so great. Owen Hart gets hit with the stunner, and he just drops to his knees and tips over. Yes. <laughs> and it wasn't even like he was trying to ruin the bump. No. It was just he interpreted it as... I'm going to be driven jaw first in the man's shoulder, and I'm going to be stunned and fall down. Yeah. It was so it was so great, yet so lame. <laughs> Which is kind of what Owen Hart, it his really character was. was. That's what his character was. And he did a video with the construction of the cell. Vince did a voiceover noting that Shawn Michaels would be trapped in this, and he'd have some heavy dues to pay. Hunter Hearst Helmsley versus The Undertaker. Sean, China, and Hunter come out. And Taker comes out. He gets jumped by Bret Hart and Davy Boy Smith for reasons I cannot fathom. And then Vader and Patriot come out to brawl with them. I couldn't fathom it either. The only thing that I could figure was that Bret hated Sean so much that he wanted to soften the Undertaker up so that Sean would win because the winner gets a shot at Bret. Okay, that's. Even if you're right, that is too much thinking to even. That is too complicated. I don't think so because. This whole angle, I thought, was so great. They Let's cut to the chase. When it's all over, DX brings out a body bag, and they beat up The Undertaker, and they lay him in the body bag. And this was just like the security guys with the helmets on their head. It you was. Knew, it was. You knew as they were celebrating that he was going to do the zombie sit-up in the body bag. And he did. Oh, it was... And you knew it was going to happen, and when they gave it to you, you were so happy. There was not a moment in the WrestleMania streak that was as great as Undertaker doing the sit-up in the body bag. So he does a sit-up in the body bag, and, of course, he beats up ten men by himself. That's the other key. Because he's the Undertaker. He comes out fighting and kills everyone. Oh, yeah. They go running, and Shawn Michaels... First, first Shawn gets cornered, but unlike the women who are trapped... He ducks under the bottom rope. Yeah. He runs. So first, he has escaped the ring. 
So now they're brawling up the ramp. And Undertaker gets his hands on Hunter. He gives Hunter a tombstone pile driver. And as he is giving him the tombstone, Sean does not care about his best buddy. No. Fuck you, dude. You're on your own. I'm getting the hell out of here. He begins to climb the Titan Tron because he has no other means of escape from this crazed dead man except to just climb to the highest place that he can get to, which, by the way, is a stupid idea. <laughs> but anyway, it was so great because they're building up a cage match with a roof on the top. So when Shawn Michaels escaped the ring... The point there was he cannot escape the ring because he will be in hell in a cell. There's nowhere to go. And when he climbed the Titan Tron, the point was you can climb the cage all you want, motherfucker, but there is a roof on top and you can't get out. This was so simple and so great. And Sean was so dislikable and you just couldn't wait to see this man put in this cell where there will be no escape and The Undertaker is going to beat this guy's ass. This was such great professional wrestling. And what a payoff we're going to get. All of that is true. And I agree. And yet you're overlooking something. Because Sean did not first go to the uh, climbing method. He intended to escape by going through the curtain and going to the back. That's right. But when he threw open the curtain, he was greeted by powerful smoke and a bright red light he didn't know what was going on no one knew what was going on but that leads to what happens at the end of the cell match how in the hell can the same guy that put this together be putting together raw in 2016 i don't know i'm just baffled it's like a totally different company run by totally different people this was i will go as far as to say this was beautiful it was a work of art it was amazing the, the build for Hell in a Cell is almost as good as the Hell in a Cell match itself. It's crazy. Everything happens for a reason. And everything leads to something else. This is the same company that put together that Mick Foley-Stephanie segment that you're going to be forced to watch here in a couple of days. Do you realize there has not been a random segment? There has not been a time filler segment in this entire program all the way back to SummerSlam? It's astonishing. God, it's great. 